here we are again back at the age-old debate of inspiration versus clone or copy. Now I've already gone over a lot of my thoughts and opinions on this matter in my Dante's Inferno retrospective, but obviously it's not a topic only relevant to a single game. And Darksiders is very much in that same category simply because, again, the game wears its inspirations on its sleeves. It's clear as day that Darksiders takes inspiration from games like God of War, Devil May Cry, and The Legend of Zelda. Though, because I've never actually played a Zelda game, I'd personally say I see more Metroidvania inspirations similar to Arkham Asylum in a way. Just because I can point out Darksiders' inspirations doesn't mean they've copied and pasted ideas though, because Darksiders feels like a great concoction of all these different genres and gameplay mechanics to a point where it feels like something truly unique. I have so many fond memories with the Darksiders series, but specifically the original. I mean, the game released when I was 13 years old, so playing a game as one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse was always going to grab my attention. But the memories of the various dungeons, environments, bosses, and characters made for a title that has stuck with me all these years later, and why I'm really excited to revisit the game today. As always though, nostalgia will get you from time to time, so let's put all of those nostalgic memories to the test. It's been about 12 years in between playthroughs, so how does Darksiders hold up today? Is it worth your time revisiting or playing for the first time? And simply, is Darksiders as good as I remember? Let's find out. First things first when it comes to the development of Darksiders. There is so close to absolutely nothing on this game's development. No usual suspects such as articles, developer diaries, that sort of thing, no matter how deep I delved into the internet. My one saving grace, however, and the reason I can even make this segment of the video at all is because of an incredible video called the Darksiders documentary on YouTube created by the Gameumentary. Obviously, I'm not going to go over the entire documentary because I strongly suggest watching it yourself, link in the description, and it's almost two hours long, but there is some great nuggets of information within that helps paint a picture of what the development process from beginning to end was like, and that's what I want to touch on. Darksiders was developed by first-time development studio Vigil Games, which was founded in 2005. Despite being a first-time studio, the team was not built of first-time developers, obviously. In fact, the engine that the first two Darksiders games were built upon was a free-time creation when one of the devs was working for another studio, and that 3D engine's potential was the reason multiple developers would leave and start up Vigil Games. The team at Vigil Games were stuck in limbo for a while in regards to what to create for their first game, knowing what they wanted the game to play like, that being primarily inspired by Zelda, but never felt great about any of their list of ideas. One being about a kid with a robot arm that seems to be an idea that lingered the longest, or at least is mentioned the most, and had some sort of potential. But no ideas really excited the team, even after locking themselves in a room until they decided on a game idea. That all changed once someone brought up the idea of the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, and the team just loved it. But that doesn't mean they got to work straight away on the Darksiders we all know and love today. Members of the team weren't even set on the name Darksiders for a long time, believing it to be just a placeholder name until ultimately, well, we know how that went. The initial idea or elevator pitch for Darksiders though was for a four player co-op action adventure featuring all four of the horsemen. It's never explained what happened or why the team moved away from this original elevator pitch of four player co-op, but if I had to venture a guess, it was probably dropped just before or after Vigil's meeting with THQ because the playtest shown around this time very much feels like the skeleton of the Darksiders we know today. 
The story of how THQ picked up Darksiders though is really interesting. The devs had built up a playtest of again essentially the skeleton of Darksiders and took that with them along with a compact PC and monitor around E3 to show the game off to try and pick up a publisher. Technical difficulties ensued, the team was even laughed out or completely dismissed from meetings and the last interview of the day was with THQ and they almost didn't go. At the time, THQ was well known for its licensed content, and with Darksiders being a new and original IP, the team just didn't think it would be a good fit, and that feeling wasn't helped at the beginning of the interview. The head of THQ barely looked up for their presentation, groaned and grumbled, and it just seemed the game wasn't going to get picked up until they finally let them play the playtester. THQ kept bringing more and more people in to have a look at the game, and they loved it, eventually picking the game up and giving Darksiders the chance it deserved. Unfortunately, despite getting greenlit, picked up, and Darksiders being a love letter from Vigil Games, it was one of those games with an infamous crunch time amongst game developers. Around an entire year of crunching, tight deadlines for new devs coming on board, and just all the mistakes that come along with running a first time studio in creating a new and highly ambitious title. As bad as the crunch sounded though, everyone seems to look back on that time fondly with a lot of team bonding, so I suppose in hindsight it's easier to remember the positives and I think there is a great analogy in this documentary for that crunch. The crunch in hindsight seems worthwhile because the game would end up succeeding, but if that weren't the case it would have felt like going to war and losing. At the end of the day, despite crunch not being something I enjoy being such a massive part of this industry, hearing the developers reminisce did make it seem like a lot of fun, I won't lie. Darksiders ended up releasing after about three and a half years of development in January 2010 to a positive reception both critically and commercially, and the rest is history. So now, after 12 years, how does Darksiders hold up? today. Since the beginning of time, the armies of heaven and hell have been at war with neither side coming out victorious over the other. Over the years, a group known as the Charred Council acted as a mediator to maintain order and balance and created a warrior brotherhood known as the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse to intervene and enforce the Council's rules when necessary. During the war, humans entered the picture and the Charred Council, believing they would be integral to the balance, named them the Third Kingdom, the Kingdom of Man. The Council finally brokered a truce between heaven and hell and created the mysterious and mystical Seven Seals, to only be broken when mankind was ready and prepared for the end war. When the player assumes control of our protagonist, war arrives on Earth as the end war has appeared to have begun as armies of angels and demons wage war which sees mankind stuck in the middle. War confronts the general of heaven's army Abaddon, which is where war discovers that the other horsemen haven't arrived, meaning the seventh seal used to summon the four horsemen has not been broken. Due to Abaddon's shock at seeing war, he ends up being killed by a demon commander, Straga, who war faces in battle and gains the advantage before quickly losing his powers mid-fight and almost is killed in the process. War is saved from death by the Charred Council, who accuse him of destroying the balance, siding with the forces of hell and bringing about the apocalypse prematurely, which has resulted in mankind's extinction. War pleads his innocence, demanding a chance to find the real culprits, which the council agrees to, but does not reinstate his lost powers and is now bound to one of their servants called the Watcher, who has permission to terminate war if he strays from his mission. War returns to Earth, though a lot of time has passed, as it has been about a century since Hell's armies led by the Destroyer annihilated humanity and the armies of Heaven. What remains of Heaven's armies have formed into a lesser resistance group now known as the Hellguard, led by Abaddon's lieutenant, 
Uriel. Soon after returning to Earth, we are greeted by the demon merchant, Volgrom, who tells War that the Black Tower is the Destroyer's lair, but to gain access, he's going to need to seek out a once powerful demon lord known as Samael. When War meets Samael, he explains that four demons have been chosen to guard the Black Tower, called the Chosen. And in exchange for Samael giving War access to the tower, he wants those Chosen's hearts. While hunting down the various demon hearts, War encounters Ulthane, a skilled blacksmith from a race known as the Makers. The two initially begin fighting each other until they are forced to defend themselves against Uriel and the Hellguard, who believe War is responsible for Abaddon's death and subsequently their defeat. War gradually picks off and Kali Mars the Four Chosen until the demon Silitha reveals that the Chosen were not meant to defend the tower, but instead prevent the return of Samael. But we give him all the hearts anyway, and even though back to full strength, maintains his deal with War and sends him to the tower, vowing they will meet again. Once in the tower, War encounters the Angel of Death, Asriel, imprisoned, and after attempting to free Asriel, confesses that Abaddon, Ulthane, and himself were the ones who brought upon the apocalypse early, as they feared further delay would risk Heaven's demise. With all the proof War needs of his innocence, he decides his mission is complete. However, the Watcher decides that the Destroyer must die to restore balance. War agrees, frees Asriel, and once again we clash with Straga and emerge victorious. Straga and the tower are one though, which means War is trapped until he is saved by Asriel and takes him to the Garden of Eden, which survives due to Asriel hiding it from the demons. War visits the Tree of Knowledge within the Garden in the hopes of gathering the knowledge to defeat the Destroyer. The tree gives War a vision though that shows Abaddon was sent to hell after he died and offered a choice by someone unknown. Serve in heaven or rule in hell. Abaddon, knowing he would be punished by heaven and the Charred Council anyway, chooses to rule in hell and becomes the Destroyer, now guarding the unbroken Seventh Seal. It is also shown that Uriel leads the Hellguard against the Destroyer and being defeated. The Council has been aware of all these facts, but knew the Horsemen would not act without proof and ended up allowing the Apocalypse early, summoning War themselves under the assumption War would track down all of these conspirators and clear his name. Finally, War witnesses himself being killed by the Watcher with a mysterious blade. After these visions, Asriel guesses the blade to be the Armageddon Blade, a weapon capable of slaying the Destroyer. But to gain this blade, we need to find the various shards and take them to Ulthane to reforge it. Whilst hunting down the Armageddon shards, Uriel faces War once again, and of course, loses the battle. War reveals to Uriel the identity of the Destroyer, and enraged by this knowledge, she leaves to prepare her angels for battle. Once War collects all the fragments, we return to Ulthane, who forges the Armageddon Blade. Meanwhile, Uriel and her angels begin their attack on the Destroyer, but are defeated as foreseen. In the aftermath, War is posed the same question as Abaddon by the Destroyer, who offers him the chance of ruling in hell. War refuses, battles the Destroyer, and slays him. War retrieves the seventh seal but is subdued by the Watcher, who takes the seal in order to prevent War from regaining his full strength, knowing he will use it to take on the Council. Uriel intervenes by taking the Armageddon Blade and stabs War in the back and shatters the seventh seal, which restores War's original power and frees him from the Council's control. The Watcher threatens the wrath of Heaven, Hell, and the Council on War before ultimately being slain. Uriel, grateful for War, absolves him of any responsibility of the harm done to the Angels, but knows her duty may require her to face War in battle again. Uriel warns War that he cannot face the forces of Heaven, Hell, and the Council alone, which he replies that, he isn't, as the other three horsemen are seen descending from the sky towards him. And that's the story for Darksiders. Now, if I were to sum up Darksiders' story in one word, 
Well, I'd say good first and foremost, but simple. It's not going to win any story awards and it's clear the gameplay was the primary focus during development and creating a story that supports the gameplay. But that doesn't mean it's bad because it's really enjoyable and at least personally, definitely grabs your attention. I mean, we are stuck in between a battle between heaven and hell and trying to figure out what on earth happened, why the apocalypse began, and why war was the only horseman summoned. It's a solid mystery in a badass world, it doesn't take itself too seriously, and it just creates so many over-the-top badass moments that make it a great time from start to finish. But for me, what carries the story and why I think I enjoyed it as much as I did is simply due to the incredible characters. They just make the story that much more engaging and interesting and are brilliantly performed by the absolutely stacked cast here. Whether it be Samael, the Watcher, Volgrim, Ulthane or War himself, the cast and these characters all have so many great quotable lines and make you want to sit and listen to what they have to say and learn Learn about these characters and how they are involved in this chaotic world. Samael is one of my personal favourite characters in Darksiders simply due to the fact that you don't trust him. You don't think what he's asking for is a good idea and yet you really have no choice. You have to take his deal and hope it doesn't blow up in your face later. But he does do what he can to build your trust. For every heart you give him despite the Watcher's wishes, Samael gifts War a new ability, so despite being sketchy, he is doing something to try and gain our trust. You end up strangely looking forward to returning to Samael because you know you're in for a new ability and almost fall into the same mindset as War, where if this does blow up and backfire, well that's a future problem. That's a common theme for a lot of these characters and their relationship with War because again, War is stuck in the middle between angels and demons. He isn't on anyone's side and because of that, he can't really trust anyone and you feel that with each character. It's almost as if you're questioning why anyone is helping you, whether it be the merchant Volgrim, brilliantly performed by Hermes' comrade himself, Phil Lamar, or Ulthane and Asriel, the Watcher, again brilliantly performed by Mark Hamill, may be your master in a sense and you know he doesn't really care for war but something is off with him from the get-go. Probably the heavy Joker voice gives me that vibe though. All of these uneasy alliances and encounters with various characters from either side makes the player easily connect with War because he's the only one we know we can trust. And at the end of the day, we know whether our gut feeling about a character is right or wrong, we're one of the four horsemen. Surely we can handle whatever this world throws at us. Even the lesser characters are intriguing, like the various demons we're hunting and slaying are captivating and make you want Want to listen. Maybe I am more intrigued by Darksiders story than others because of my love for the topic. Angels and demons, heaven and hell, the four horsemen all meshed into this heavy metal style of game just grabs my attention. But I don't think this story works as well as it does without the top tier performances and characters in this crazy apocalyptic world. If I was to nitpick the story, I would say it falls off a little bit when searching for all the demon hearts. Just not a lot really happens in these moments and it's a large section of the game with not a lot of story happening. But other than that, I just really enjoyed what was on offer here. Again, the story, at least in my opinion, doesn't feel like it was Darksiders' main focus. It's not the game's strongest point, but it's highly entertaining. It's a badass journey that grabs your attention from beginning to end with a nice little mystery whodunit, but the characters this story has are what make it so unique and honestly special. This story can be described as simple. But I do not mean that as a negative, nor does that mean you can't fully immerse yourself in this game's lore, which is surprisingly in-depth. But it knows what it wanted to accomplish, it succeeds in that badass over-the-top goal, and makes for an enjoyable story that backs the gameplay beautifully.
the gameplay for Darksiders is where that pesky topic of clone versus inspiration comes into play because there are a lot of mechanics in Darksiders that you could point to and be like, oh, that feels like or is reminiscent of certain game. I mean, just from my own personal experience, you have the health system similar to Medieval, the combat similar to a mix of God of War and Devil May Cry. Even though I've never played one, I know the dungeons are very similar to that of Zelda. The new items and abilities accompanied by backtracking like any good Metroidvania, and even the more demonic and angelic enemy designs feel right at home in something like Diablo. Whilst I listed off quite a few games there, I don't see Darksiders gameplay as this unoriginal concoction of being there done that ideas because it feels like the developers were fans of these titles, thought their given systems and mechanics would work well together and ended up making something wholeheartedly unique in Darksiders. So let's dive into the specifics and I'll try and explain why I think that is. First and foremost though, I do want to get this off my chest. In my humble opinion, Darksiders doesn't hit its stride until the Twilight Cathedral. Not saying the first couple of hours are terrible or unenjoyable, but once you get to the first dungeon, that's when the puzzles, platforming, combat, and even bosses start to mesh together really well, and to me, that's when this game finds its identity. Before the cathedral though, something just felt off about playing this game for me, and I think it has to do with the initially lackluster combat. Now this isn't a problem unique to Darksiders because you can't just have all the combinations unlocked from the get-go, otherwise what are you working towards in regards to feeling more powerful? But it is really bare bones here in the beginning. There just isn't enough variety in the combinations to start for my liking and because of the lack of variety and lack of puzzles and platforming until you get to some of the dungeons, the combat deficiencies are highlighted for far too long making me honestly believe this game had aged horribly and my nostalgia had lied to me. Thankfully that didn't end up being the case and once the combat and all the other mechanics open up Darksiders is an absolute blast that had me smiling from ear to ear pretty much the whole way through. But that doesn't mean the lackluster opening isn't still a problem, it just improves from here onwards. So with that little confession out the way, let's actually break down Darksiders mechanics, starting with the combat. War ends up amassing quite the arsenal of weapons or gadgets by the end of Darksiders. You have access to the Chaos Eater, which is War's trusty blade, the Earth Caller, Death Scythe, the Tremor Gauntlet, Mercy, the Crossblade, Abyssal Chain, and Void Walker in regards to physical weapons, but then you also have to factor in War's Chaos Form, the various Wrath abilities, War's Horse Ruin and Horse Combat, and the equipable runes that change up your weapons depending on the effect. In short, you have a lot of tools and abilities to play around with in Darksiders Combat, on top of leveling everything up through Volgrim, unlocking even more potential. This, all of these options, makes Darksiders Combat so much fun because even after just a few more combinations or weapons it feels like it's again finding what it means to have Darksiders style combat. No, each gadget and weapon are not created equal. The Scythe and Tremor Gauntlet just aren't as dependable or various as the Chaos Eater for example. At least they weren't for me, but I did have the better runes and combinations unlocked, so that could have had something to do with it. But they all feel like they can be useful, whether that be more for platforming, puzzles, or combat. Darksiders combat doesn't take forever to become interesting though. In fact, just from going to Volgrim a few times and purchasing combinations and wrath abilities, the combat becomes a lot more enjoyable because it's not just simple light and heavy attacks. You have piercing or dashing attacks, cyclone slams, backflips, and your standard variations on hacking and slashing maneuvers that through leveling up get either more complex or deal more damage. All of these attacks feel great. There isn't anything that comes to mind that feels useless, and combining different combinations only maximizes your damage output. The combat has a great flow about it, but not like a God of War or Devil May Cry. War is a lot more 
sluggish or tanky in his movements, but the hacking and slashing is just so smooth and seamless that makes the combat feel so fluent with the added bonus of feeling like what you're doing is packing a real punch to the enemies. The reason I'm highlighting the Chaos Eater the most, at least compared to the other melee weapons at War's disposal, is because, again, I leveled it up the most, but the reason I did so was because you can only increase your Chaos Meter and unlock War's Chaos Form through using the Chaos Eater. You don't get anything for killing enemies with the Scythe or Gauntlet, so even though they're fun ways to mix up the combat or great for specific enemies, you always want to have the Chaos Chaos form available because it's a blast and a power trip for one, but two, it's just necessary in the bigger encounters. I do wish the Chaos form wasn't tied to a single weapon to encourage using the Scythe and Gauntlet because they feel so different from one another and are a lot of fun to use, but sadly they limited experimentation slightly with this decision and the longer the game goes on, the more you just have to use the Chaos Eater constantly gaining you that chaos form. As for the rest of War's arsenal, the ranged abilities act as great supporting weapons. They aren't big damage dealers, but they aren't supposed to be. The crossblade is probably the most reliable and useful in my opinion, just simply because it deals a solid amount of damage, can lock onto multiple enemies, and if nothing else, stun lock enemies while you focus fire on another enemy. <laughs> Probably my least favourite is the Mercy Pistol, only because the Crossblade feels like the far superior ranged option. As for the Earthcaller and Abyssal Chain, they're more puzzle and platforming items, but in combat act as great complements to War's melee options. And then we have War's Horse Ruin and Horse Combat. Now personally, I didn't partake much in actual combat with Ruin, but it works really well. Ruin has great speed, moves really well, and just feels so powerful looking down and slaying these worthless demons. Speaking of the enemies, there is quite a bit of variety here as well, at least visually. You have enemies big and small, ground based and airborne, one hit kills, and enemies that take multiple executions, speedy and slow, enemies with status effects, all that good stuff. The variety in the enemies make utilizing your whole arsenal for the most part a necessity and makes combat a lot of fun to participate in and at times like the waves and waves of angels with Ulthane is a tense encounter that is a nail biter to the end. The enemies aren't the brightest, they can get stuck in certain cycles of attacks or attacking war one on one instead of as a group, but for the most part it's pretty impressive. If I had to criticize the combat, it would be more so a nitpick with the executions. They're just very repetitive and get boring to watch after a couple of hours. Other than that, and the lackluster first hour or so of combat, as a whole, it's a lot of fun to play. Whilst we're on the combat, and before we move on to the level design, puzzles, and platforming, we need to talk about Darksiders bosses. The bosses in Darksiders are pretty simple in terms of difficulty and strategy. This isn't top quality boss design and for the most part every boss is rather easy. But the bosses aren't trying to be a Dark Souls or Soul series level threat. They're trying to be badass battles and in that regard I think the bosses here succeed and that's something that is shown as early as the first battle against Straga. The first boss fight against Straga is not a taxing fight. You throw cars at him when able and dodge his attacks when there are no cars available. It's simple and I'd like more player engagement personally, but his attacks are pretty damn awesome. I mean he picks up an entire street to try and defeat war. I wish this Straga battle being the tutorial boss showed the player a bit more of the mechanics. All it really does is highlight the lock on feature specifically for one on one battles, but it's a nice visual if nothing else. The first real boss after Straga though is Tiamat, and again it sort of highlights what I'm talking about as she flies around the cathedral and you hurl bombs damaging her enough to land and wail on her until she's done. Tiamat is a much more engaging and dangerous fight, but by no means difficult. She can just deal a lot of damage, and when you're aiming in with your crossblade, she can spit fireballs at you, but it's more badass than anything. Just look at her design. You're slaying a giant 
that demon. It's just cool and enjoyable enough to keep the player interested. Next is the battle against the Griever, who has more of a puzzle-esque fight about it. It's not a hard puzzle, but you're not really fighting against this creature in a one-on-one -on -one sense, as you need to continuously hurl a train car into it and avoid the swarms of insects along the way. It's a different fight and not the most spectacular in terms of spectacle, but it's alright. Now the Stygian fight is one of my personal favourites for the game because it takes place on horseback as you avoid this unnerving sandworm who can appear and disappear pretty damn easily and sneak up on you if you aren't careful. Again, like the rest, not too challenging, but an absolute pleasure to experience and the massive arena accompanied with the image of war on his apocalyptic horse is just pure Darksiders badassness. Then we have the battle against Silitha, who aside from Uriel and Abaddon is one of the more engaging fights in the game as she teleports around so frequently and can do big damage quickly that it means you need to be on your P's and Q's and utilize your Abyssal Chain to gain ground quickly. This fight is pretty decent and engaging to boot along with feeling right at home down in Australia as I try and get to my car in the morning but have to fight off giant spiders. After this we come up against the tower golems that are just plain boring and repeat too often and then we have the fight against Straga again which this time around is again waiting around dodging attacks until he reveals a chain point on his weapon to swing around and stab him in the back. His size and appearance is pretty awesome but Straga just isn't a great boss at the beginning or end. Thankfully he isn't the final fight though as we go head to head against Abaddon. This along with the Stygian battle is one of my favourites because it blends badass and actually engaging combat into one. The arena is massive as you begin riding atop Ruin and face off against the giant dragon and then proceeding to fight his demonic self one on one. It's all just so much fun. As you can see from my health bar though I definitely found my rhythm by this point so challenge wise leaves a little to be desired, but also I have no idea how this is on the hardest difficulty, but I'm talking on hard, not too bad. As a whole, pure, pure excitement and stimulus, which is what the developers were going for. That's all without talking about the mini bosses like the Jailer or the Abyssal Gladiator or Uriel or Shadow War, which are again just a lot of fun and make sure you are maximizing your tools at your disposal. Darksiders is not all combat though, and it's actually the other aspects of this game that were so much better than I remembered. Like, for example, as I've said in other videos, I'm not a proficient puzzle solver and can get stumped on some honestly dumb shit, which is why I think the dungeons never really did much for me back in the day. Blasphemy, I know. But damn, they're my favourite parts playing today and that's simply due to how impressive the level design is here. Darksiders world is constantly begging you to go out and explore every nook and cranny which is evident right from the word go. Like the hidden passage in the graveyard or the more explorable underwater caverns with branching paths or jumping off a cliff hoping to land on a hidden platform below. All these levels, environments and areas have so many hidden secrets that you won't be able to find your first time through but are worth going back to and finding them because there are so many hidden rewards hidden away to help you in the long run. Sure, some big upgrades are just in plain sight and a little lacking in terms of, well, being secret, but it makes exploring so much more captivating and intriguing. The levels are so well paced between combat, platforming and puzzles that it means you never tire of one gameplay mechanic because of how often it changes everything up. The levels also don't really force you to backtrack if you don't want to until the apocalypse blade, but you want to because of what you could be missing out on like the wicked K encounters or armor, runes, souls, life and wrath shards. They're just really well designed locales that goes doubly so for most of the dungeons. Twilight Cathedral is a great first dungeon for instance because it shows how finely tuned the gameplay loop is and the variation from mechanic to mechanic. It's not the most challenging in terms of puzzles or progression like say the Black Throne, but again, 
it makes exploring the environment, fighting off enemies, platforming and puzzling your way through and around to finally reach Tiamat so much more engaging and fun to play. The same can be said for the hollow and the very metro-esque subway systems or the unique and expansive ashlands that at first is so terrifying to traverse as the sandworms can easily catch you in the sluggish sand until you unlock, ruin, slay the worms and can freely explore this massive desert. Or the spider infested unsettling nightmare that is the iron canopy. They all just have such a great feeling of progression along with mixing up every element to Darksiders so well that makes them truly the highlight of the whole experience. The Black Throne however does feel like the team were at the deadline quite a bit. The puzzles are great thinkers, the platforming and teleporting is super solid and a ton of fun and the combat is some of the most challenging in the game. But it just feels too repetitive as you go through objectives multiple times to free Asriel. It's not terrible because the challenge is on point but it just doesn't feel as tight or fresh as the rest of these incredible dungeons even though puzzle combat and platforming wise it's some of this game's most engaging. While we're on lower points in the level design, I have to say those shadow arenas just grind this game's pacing to a screeching halt. They're essentially long-winded tutorials for the most part and they just feel like padding in all honesty. Just a poor decision and feels unnecessary when compared to how incredible this game's levels, pacing and gameplay mix-ups are. In terms of the platforming and puzzle specifics, the platforming is super solid, War has a great weight and height to his jumps, the climbing, gliding and all that good stuff paired with teleporting and chain swinging, it makes for an enjoyable and less mentally taxing break from combat as opposed to the puzzles which again are tight. For the most part they aren't the toughest solves requiring either a piece of equipment or pushing something to another location but in the black throne they truly shine like with the room with a ton of switches that move different walls higher or lower and trying to traverse to the end of this maze or the rotating block that needs you to have a portal on each side of this pit to throw a bomb and destroy something in your way or slowing down time in the ashlands to traverse the world safely and solve the various out post tower puzzles. If you're looking for hardcore puzzles, Darksiders just isn't it, but for me they're the perfect level of fun and challenge and make for an engaging break from combat that has you actively participating which for this style of game is fantastic. Overall the gameplay for Darksiders is just simply fun. The combat when it gets going is an absolute blast. The puzzles are stimulating, the platforming is at times relaxing and feels great to use, the bosses are frequent injections of badass, but that level design in my opinion is what carries this game and what makes it so damn spectacular. Darksiders gameplay isn't without fault, but for the amount of ambition, love and care Vigil put into this game and how all of these ideas and gameplay influences could have crumbled if not executed as well as they are, it's just really impressive. At the end of the day, after all of this yabbering on, Darksiders is so much fun to play and the flaws in no way outweigh how incredible this game feels to play. So, was Darksiders as good as I remembered? No. It was better. I loved Darksiders back in the day, but for different reasons than I do today. I wasn't big on the dungeons, but loved the environments and combat. And now, well, I still love the environments and combat, but on top of that, I love these dungeons, exploring this world, the puzzles, weapons, upgrades, these characters, and this story. Darksiders was extremely ambitious. And yeah, some of those ambitions don't pan out, like the flying moment before the cathedral, for instance, isn't a great moment, or the repetitive moments in gameplay at times. But most of it sticks the landing and then some. I don't think I appreciated Darksiders enough until now. And I loved it back in the day. But now with age, I've come to realize just how impressive all of this is for a first time development team no less, 
and just how ambitious for better or worse the various mechanics are. I had a blast from beginning to end with Darksiders 12 years later and now I cannot wait to see how my favourite game in the series, Darksiders 2, holds up as well. Every time I begin revisiting a series of games for these retrospectives, whatever that series may be, there is always one game that above all the rest, I just can't wait to play. One game that no matter how much I love a series as a whole, that one from memory is my favourite, and I'm so excited to finally revisit it. For example, God of War 3 was that game, Resistance 2 was that game, Killzone 2 was that game, Batman Arkham City was that game, and as I'm sure you've guessed from this analogy, Darksiders 2 is that game. As much as I loved the original Darksiders back in the day, it was nothing compared to the love I had for the sequel. I can still vividly remember seeing the 2011 E3 trailer and how excited I was to not only see that Darksiders was getting a sequel, but they were changing up the Horsemen, which meant we'd at least see four games in this series. Though that didn't exactly go to plan. Little did I know they'd be changing up more than just the Horsemen for the sequel though, and once I got my hands on Darksiders 2 in August 2012, I just could not stop playing. A nice juicy open world, new loot and RPG mechanics, a wealth of side missions, a completely different playstyle for combat, and in general there was just so much more content to experience here that every night after school or on the weekend after this game released, I was just playing more and more until I did everything I possibly could. For me, Darksiders 2 has always been criminally underrated and underappreciated even though critically the game did quite well. But to me Darksiders 2 was that near perfect game, so close to a 10 that I didn't understand why it didn't get the recognition back in 2012 it deserved. That's why I was so excited to revisit this game today above the rest of the series. But as I always say, nostalgia is a tricky beast. And not only that, but a decade is a long ass time between playthroughs, and my tastes when it comes to gaming have definitely changed since then. So now that I've finished revisiting Darksiders 2, the question is, how does it hold up 10 years later? Is it worth your time revisiting or playing through for the first time? And simply, is Darksiders 2 as good as I remember? Let's find out. Darksiders 2 is set during War's 100 year imprisonment, so this story isn't a prequel, but more or less runs parallel with Darksiders 1. The four horsemen, War, Strife, Fury and Death, our protagonists for this game, are the last of their kind known as the Nephilim, a cursed fusion of angels and demons who wage war on all of creation. In order to preserve the balance, the four horsemen as they would become tired of their kind's constant conquest and slaughtered all of their own kin in exchange for incredible abilities and powers from the Charred Council. Death personally slayed the last Nephilim, who ironically was the first Nephilim, Absalom, and this feat earned Death the title of Kinslayer amongst others. What the Charred Council was not aware of though was that Death secretly preserved the souls of the Nephilim in an amulet, gifting it to the Crow Father, also known as the Keeper of Secrets, for safekeeping. Flash forward some time and whilst War is being charged for his crimes, Death is certain his brother is innocent and sets out on a personal mission to erase his brother's crime, which means resurrecting humanity and this is where our game begins. Death travels to the Icy Veil, a dimension that sits between the three kingdoms of heaven, hell and earth, where he meets the Crow Father in search of proof of War's innocence and a way to restore Earth. The Crow Father tells Death that he must go to the Tree of Life in order to restore humanity, but demands that Death take back his amulet. Death refuses and the Crow Father attacks in the shape of War which results in Death being forced to kill the Crow Father. 
This shatters the amulet and sees the fragments embed themselves in Death's chest, knocking him out and sending him into a portal created from the Crowfather's death. We awaken in the Forge Lands, which is populated by the Makers, who are a race known as the Architects of Creation. It's here we learn that their world, along with many others, have been overrun with corruption, a dark force that inconveniently has blocked off the Tree of Life and has taken over numerous Makers constructs. In an effort to combat the corruption, the Makers had begun to craft a massive Guardian, but had to abandon it before finishing the task due to the surrounding threats. With the help of the Constructs and a Maker named Khan, Death reaches the Guardian, however upon its activation, the Guardian is tainted by corruption, forcing it into a rampage. Death battles the behemoth and destroys it, allowing it to reassemble free of corruption and then go over and self-destruct in the grasp of the creature blocking the tree of life, which lets Death reach his goal. Once Death reaches the entrance to the tree though, he is seized by corruption and dragged within. Here Death is approached by the shadowy, corrupted form of Absalom, whose hatred for Death lasted beyond his defeat by Death's hands and birthed the corruption enabling him to take his revenge on creation. Death is then transported to the Kingdom of the Dead where he meets the merchant Ostagoth. It's from Ostagoth where Death learns that he must find the Well of Souls in order to bring back mankind. To find the Well of Souls though, first he needs to speak with the Lord of Bones. To do that, we complete various trials to gain an audience with the Lord of Bones. Death is transported to the City of the Dead to find a soul capable of telling Death what he needs to know and do about the well. Death faces off against a creature that houses all of mankind's souls and it's from here we meet that soul the Lord had alluded to, the Crow Fathers. The Crow Father tells Death that the souls of humanity are no longer bound to a host and have been transported to the well. We also learn that the Well of Souls has the power over life and death, and with it, the spirits of all things living are cleansed and renewed before they're sent off to be reborn. To access the well, Death needs to acquire two keys. One is kept by the angels and the other by the demons. Death wonders why the horsemen never knew of the powers of the well and the crow father explains that the council feared if the horsemen had learned about its power they might try to resurrect the Nephilim. First Death seeks out the key held by the angels and is sent to an outpost in heaven called Lost Light which like every other land and realm has fallen under an assault by corruption. We reach the Ivory Tower and meet Archon who tells Death that his answers are in the Ivory Citadel which is overrun by corruption. Archon sends Death to Earth to bring back the Rod of Arafel, a powerful holy weapon, so that the way to the Citadel can be cleared. On Earth, Death encounters the remnants of the Hellguard led by Uriel, and with their help, Death reassembles the Shattered Rod. Once we reach the Citadel and confront its custodian, Jamarat the Scribe, Death realizes that the Archon has held the key this whole time and has fallen to corruption as well. So we return to Lost Light, kill the Archon and acquire the first key. Death then heads over to Shadow's Edge, described as a dark reflection of Lost Light. Upon his arrival, Death sees the world itself is in the process of being devoured by corruption. Death travels to the fortress home of the Demon Lord Samael, only to find Lilith, the Demon Queen responsible for the creation of the Nephilim and is why she refers to herself as Death's mother. Death learns from Lilith that Samael is gone but he can meet with the Demon Lord through the use of a time portal. Before he can leave though, Death is urged by Lilith to follow his heart and revive the Nephilim once he reaches the Well of Souls. After going through the fortress in both the past and present, we finally meet Samael, who is not willing to just give Death 
the key. Samael tests death in battle and after succeeding, gives death the demon key. Now with both keys in hand, Death returns to the Tree of Life where we meet the Crow Father who reminds Death that the fate of two races, humanity and the Nephilim, are at stake here and warns that the corruption has chosen a champion to block Death's efforts. Death uses the keys and proceeds to the Well of Souls where he is met by Absalom. Absalom taunts and mocks Death by saying that corruption does not harm Death because he is already blackened by the sin of betrayal. Death and Absalom face off in battle. Death defeats him, just as he did eons ago, and the Crow Father appears one last time. He explains that Death may tap the well's power to restore one race, but a sacrifice is needed to do so, and choosing one race will forever doom the other. Death, as he said from the get-go, chooses to save war and sacrifices the souls of the Nephilim as well as his own because, well, they're attached to him and leaps into the well. In an epilogue, we are retold the final moments from the first game and when the scene of the other horsemen arriving appears, the narrator states that the number of the riders shall forever be four. Alluding to the fact that despite Death's sacrifice, He's just fine. In a post credit scene, Lilith is seen being berated by a being who is completely in shadow, probably Lucifer, angered that humanity has been restored and the Nephilim are lost forever. Lilith says she awaits punishment with a smile, but the entity states that she will get no pleasure from it this time. And as the screen fades, Lilith is heard screaming in agony. And that's the story for Darksiders 2. In regards to Darksiders 2's story, if I'm honest, I didn't enjoy it as much as the original Darksiders this time around. That's not to say the story is bad, far from it in fact, but what I think the original has and the sequel doesn't is the truly engaging characters. Death and his supporting cast this time around, whilst interesting and adding so much lore and much needed backstory with characters like the Crow Father, the various makers and their constructs, the undead souls like the Lord of Bones, or the intrigue surrounding Lilith for example, but they just don't compare to characters like the Watcher or Volgrom or Samael, who whilst two of these characters are present here, they either sadly get no story presence or just aren't involved enough to be nearly as compelling as before. I do believe Darksiders 2's story is leagues and leagues above the originals in terms of world building, how much more you are able to engage and expand upon conversations through the dialogue wheels, the backstory for the horsemen and the Nephilim, there is an ever present threat throughout the whole story, and like the original, they give you a plot that leads to vast and unique locales as well as truly badass encounters and moments in new realms and heaven, hell and earth alike. I'm not saying this isn't an interesting story because it had me hooked from the beginning to the end, and even though death choosing between humanity and the Nephilim is an obvious choice, you still question what death will choose because he is clearly conflicted the whole journey. But my favourite aspect to Darksiders story was those characters and how much I was invested in just hearing them all speak, and here in Darksiders 2, they don't have that same charisma. Again, I was truly invested in what these characters were saying this time around because they expand on this world beautifully, but none are nearly as memorable as the top tier characters of the original, and for me, that was a bit of a letdown. But I don't want this to come off as doom and gloom because there is a lot to like here and I can move past the characters and their interactions with death this time around because... Well, Death isn't war, nor is he in the same situation. Death is trying to save his brother from persecution, and because he isn't automatically the guilty one, his interactions with the absolute wealth of characters we meet on this journey are much more settled. You feel more helpful as opposed to helpless, and whilst you need to help the makers or the dead or the angels to progress further to our goal, it feels like Death is in control. Sure, he gets used by the likes of the Lord of Bones who has us recruit his various leaders only to kill them shortly after, and Archon who just 
straight up fools us, but for the most part, death is in the driver's seat. This feeling of being helpful means death's interaction with characters like the makers are much more pleasant than anything we experienced before, meaning you aren't questioning everyone's intentions, which ultimately leads to some downfalls, but for the most part, lets us just absorb what we're being told about this world and its inhabitants. It's a shame with that feeling they don't pair that with some star-studded characters, but I'll leave that alone now. With all my character slain, though, I do have to correct the ship slightly and say that I loved Death and his story arc here. He may at times deliver some questionable lines that made me laugh more than anything, but as a whole, he has great motivation, the backstory, learning about the Nephilim, and how even though Death essentially dealt the finishing blow to his own kind, he could not let them go. The more this story goes on, you feel this conflict building surrounding the Nephilim's souls, and you know it's going to come down to them or saving his brother. Yes, the answer seems obvious, but that doesn't mean the conflict within isn't felt, and it's touches like that, or how you can see that Absalom taunting him and calling him a betrayer is something that has eaten him up inside. I just found myself really empathising with death. He's a smooth talker and a badass horseman, but the conflict and reason for his quest is something I really enjoyed, and in terms of characters, he sits at the top here, no question. In regards to gripes with the story itself, yeah, Death's sacrifice is ultimately made a little pointless. I was hoping once Lilith arrived, she'd be a more present character than she ended up being. I was hoping for more of a Samael role here, but she just isn't around for long enough. But other than that, and you know, not as strong a cast of characters, going for more quantity over quality, I had a lot of fun with Darksiders 2's story. In my opinion, it may not be as strong character-wise as the original, which is something that I really loved about Darksiders 1, but everything else is extremely well done. The world building, backstory behind the horsemen, new races and realms to learn about and explore, building upon the original in meaningful ways, and the new dialogue trees, whilst simplistic and maybe not at a Mass Effect level, still helps the player learn more or less about this world if they want. At the end of the day, it's another absolutely badass journey with a much more interesting story, and again, it just supports the gameplay so perfectly, it's hard not to have a good time with. When you think of most sequels in gaming, more often than not, the mindset seems to be, if the original was any good of course, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's not the case here in regards to the gameplay for Darksiders 2, and whilst I'm not talking the level of difference like say, Jack and Daxter to Jack 2, Vigil still shook up the formula quite a lot here. Was it all for the better? For the most part, I think so. They fixed a lot of the issues I had with the original, but some things, while not bad per se, didn't gel with me as much this time around. Let's get into the meat and potatoes though, because we do have a lot to cover here. And first things first, I want to address the tutorial or opening hours in Darksiders 2. The tutorial aspect and opening hour or so of the original Darksiders was pretty poor when compared to the rest of the game. And I think a big reason as to why that is, was because it took a while before Darksiders felt like it had found its rhythm or general formula. The combat was bare bones, no real puzzles or great platforming challenges. It all just kind of felt a bit meh until the first dungeon. That's not the case here in Darksiders 2. This time around, it feels like Vigil Games, despite mixing up the formula, knew exactly what they wanted Darksiders 2 to play like, and that's evident right from the get-go. For a tutorial, this trek through the Icy Veil feels so organic, as you progressively are showing the ropes to combat, the loot system, changes to platforming, having access to Death's Steed Despair from the jump, and all whilst not shying away from the badass encounters like battling an Ice Golem or fighting against war. This is all within the first half an hour or so as well, and that's about all the tutorial you'll get in Darksiders 2. It's not a massive 
info dump, but it gives you the basics in an engaging way through the interesting locale and boss fights, and most importantly, it doesn't feel like a separate part of the game. Everything here just gets expanded upon, but the general gameplay is all based on what you learn here. Maybe I'm looking into all of this too much because of how disappointing the original was in this department, but I think they nailed the execution of this tutorial and I was hooked from here onward. Not to say the tutorial is the best aspect of Darksiders 2 or anything, but it feels more natural to go from this into the rest of the game. Okay, with the tutorial out of the way, let's dive into the rest of the game. As always, beginning with combat. Now, if I was to compare combat between Darksiders 1 and 2, I'd have to say it feels like the difference between Dark Souls and Bloodborne. It's not the perfect analogy, but those who have played both probably get the gist. In short, whilst at a glance the combat between the two games may look similar, they feel quite different to play, and a big reason as to why that is, is the difference in the protagonist. Where War was a much tankier, heavier feeling character, death is much speedier and well, feels more deadly, but is built more like a glass cannon. Does a lot of damage and can do it quick to boot, but isn't the most durable, which is represented through the change of the health systems. No more endless health bars here, we've got potions to heal up in combat, but that health bar is singular, and you need to be on your P's and Q's if you want to maintain a good level of health throughout the tougher encounters. Now I'm going to come back to this point shortly, but I varied off a tad from the actual combat so let's get back to that. In Darksiders 2, there is no blocking or parrying. You have a dodge and dash, but that's about it when it comes to death's defense outside of the loot system, which again, I'll go over more in a second. Defense, or lack thereof here, in Darksiders 2 is where that analogy comes into play. Speed is your defense. Damage is your defense, and the quicker you can get enemies out of encounters, the better off you'll be because if you stagnate or linger, you are put in tougher and tougher situations. It doesn't seem like a huge difference, and I'm not acting like dashing and finding openings weren't a thing in the original, but when you completely remove blocking and change so much about the protagonist, the flow to the gameplay changes drastically. And personally, I thought it was a great change. At the combat's core though, the two games are still quite similar, so it doesn't have this immediate disconnect with fans. Combat begins much the same way and expands through purchasing more combinations and those combos are based more on timing, like a fighting game, given square or X is the only attack button for your scythes. You still have horse combat, a few power-ups are similar, like the grapple hook that is now a hand, death has... Well, a death meter, all that sort of thing is very much the same as before, but the way combat feels is just so different. In regards to the main weapon on offer here, the scythes compared to the Chaos Eater are just so much more like daggers, again, much quicker and deal smaller damage, and they just feel so great to use. They just create a beautiful flow with their attacks and combinations, especially once you start mixing in cyclones and spinning attacks or harder hitting full death mode attacks. And even a lot of the special abilities are quite scythe oriented and visually so damn awesome. They're just a great primary weapon that always feel the most relevant even when you start finding stronger and stronger secondary weapons, which brings me to the loot system. The loot system in Darksiders 2 is one of the best new implementations Vigil Games could have made with this sequel, in my opinion, because it is so combat centric and that means the combat, no matter if it's your first hour or 20th hour, it's always keeping things fresh, interesting and filled with variety. One minute you may have a slow lumbering hammer as your secondary, which creates a beautiful yin and yang with the size, and the next encounter you may have more of a gauntlet that are even quicker than your scythes, but much closer in range. Weapon wise, there isn't a smorgasbord of options. They'll either be an axe, hammer, some type of gauntlet, maybe bladed or something like that, but visually they do have quite a bit of variety and the stats are the most important thing, which change up drastically from weapon to weapon, armor piece to armor piece. 
You have status effects like Ice and Fire, Health and Wrath Regen, Higher or Lower Critical Chance and Damage, Added Defense, Health, Wrath, More Resources Upon Kills, More Death Meter Per Kill, the list goes on. This is where that variety comes into play because it's not just about raw damage. Or maybe it is for you. Maybe you prioritize other sources of damage, need more health and defense for certain fights. Whatever it may be, it's worth having a lot of options available and that's not a problem you'll run into here in Darksiders 2 because you find stuff constantly. Not everything's a winner and when that's the case, it's a good thing you have possessed weapons which take sacrifice loot to level up and make that weapon better. This is a mechanic I'm sure was implemented so that players can keep gear they like for as long as possible, but possessed weapons are really what you're after here in Darksiders 2. They may have a level cap and eventually you do need to move on, but they're just so useful and always get better that makes you excited to pick up loot even if you have no interest in using it. It's just a good sacrifice. Possessed weapons are hard to come by. Most of mine came from exchanging boatman coins and a ton of money to get them from Volgrim, but they're well worth it and through that economy help the player want to go out and explore the world more. My only gripe with this system actually isn't about finding the loot itself, but buying. It's sort of pointless unless they're from Volgrim or at least that was my experience. They usually don't stay the most useful for long, they're damn expensive for anything good and you can't level them up so they're just not worth the investment or money that can be better spent at Volgrim or on different combinations. Other than that though, I think this was a great inclusion that really helps freshen up the combat from one to another and is vital if you want to survive these enemy encounters. Which brings me back to those tougher enemy encounters. Darksiders 2 is a lot more challenging than the original because of its emphasis on attacking being your best defense, paired with death's smaller health pool, limited number of potions, optimizing your loot to best fit your encounter, or just in general help your survivability and attacking efficiency and to match this the enemies themselves leveling up throughout your journey being able to take a hit more comfortably and also being or seeming much quicker as well. I died quite a bit in Darksiders 2 which is something I cannot say for the original. This game has some serious challenge to it and sometimes it's not always great like Potions, for instance, being at times plentiful and others you won't see one for hours, forcing you to backtrack and buy some. And then you find some and can't pick them up. But generally, it's much more engaging, tense and satisfying to participate in combat, which is something I love in my video games. It feels good to start and find your rhythm in this game, find your flow between attacks, special abilities, horse combat if able, and perfectly dodge and evade enemies in the process. It's a much more engaging experience combat wise and with the frequent changes to your arsenal, it means you're always finding that flow again and repeating that cycle and it just for me didn't get old. I should also mention they did fix the death or war meter here in combat as well with a special talisman so no more focusing on just one weapon which was a great fix though it does limit me wanting to use other talismans. Really my only problem with the combat is due to the more open nature of the game and a more frequent reliance on the lock on feature. It just zooms in too much for the larger arenas but without it the camera can lag behind a Bit. It's not a huge problem but something I noticed the longer I played and I think if you are going to have your lock on zoom in or focus so aggressively on one enemy, well don't do that and zoom it out for a better view. Other than that though, this combat is an absolute blast and that carries over this time to the bosses as well. Okay, so there are a lot of bosses here in Darksiders 2, like supposedly around 36, including mini bosses and side quest encounters. So for my sake, I'm not gonna go over every single boss in Darksiders 2. What I will say about the vast majority of these battles though, before I go over what I believe to be the main game bosses, is that again, they're a huge improvement over the original for me. Don't get me wrong, badass wise, I think the original has it, but in terms of the actual battles, and again going back to that challenge, they're just more my sort of speed. 
For the most part, they're all just tense, engaging battles that will put you in your place quickly if you aren't prepared. Not every fight is like this, but it's definitely more often than not with some battles this time around that actually took me a couple of tries to get right. But let's get into more specifics because the improvement to the bosses is evident right from the battle against War, or the Crowfather dressed as War. Look, this is a tutorial battle, so it's not at the height of challenge, but War is no less a great battle, and he's a great opponent to teach the player the difference in playstyles between the two horsemen. As I mentioned, he's much more tankish than Death, but it helps show the player how to effectively use Death's greatest strength, his speed. Dodging in and out of attacking, utilising your minimal toolset to the best of your abilities, and before long you'll have learnt the basics and had a badass fight to boot. After this tutorial, in regards to the main fights, you do have a few that sort of blend together due to how similar they are, whether it be Khan or the Construct Hulk in the main game content or the Corrupted Custodian in the side missions for example, are these hulking masses of rock that are a good time to fight but again, they feel like they repeat with a fresh skin. They have big attacks, do big damage and it's up to death to manoeuvre around and utilise that ever important speed to come out victorious. The appeals to these battles is definitely that feeling of David vs the Goliath, but I do wish they didn't feel so alike is all. Overall some good battles though for sure and they need to be taken seriously or you'll be out of potions real quick. The next battle, or battle against something new, is against the giant beetle called Karkonos, who is probably the most gimmicky fight of the game. You mostly wait around for giant boulders to fall and hurl them at this giant insect to stun them and then attack all you can. It's not a bad fight and a gimmick isn't a negative, in fact it stands out here because of how different it is from the rest. Not the most challenging, but an enjoyable fight. Now spectacle wise, nothing tops the Guardian boss fight because holy hell is this epic. You ride around the massive arena with despair and, whilst I've never played it, it has a very big Shadow of the Colossus vibe. As is often the case with the huge spectacle fights, it isn't the most challenging or complex, but for what it is, it had my eyes glued to the screen, ready to take down this corrupted behemoth. The fight against Nasha is a great time when the damn thing leaves the underground. There is quite a bit of waiting around here in the first phase, but once the skelly worm starts evolving before us, this is good fun because whilst it is similar to the construct fights, its attacks are much quicker and more whip and spinning like that makes dodging and attacking a lot harder. Maybe it's something to do with the design as well, but just good fun and something different while sticking in the same realm as the big lumbering bosses. The battle against Pharisee is like they took the battle against war and then made it not for the tutorial. Pharisee functions much the same, more tankish, but with the bonus now of summoning the undead to distract you and if you don't keep an eye out, you'll be punished quickly. The human battles are always much more enjoyable because they feel like they match the player's skill set a bit better and test their skill and that's exactly what Pharisee does. Then we face off against the Bone Keeper who initially is, well just wailing on a helpless skelly. How quickly things change. Again, the Bone Keeper turns into more of the same big lumbering foe that feels good to zip around and deal damage, but you know, I've said it before by this point. Enjoyable fight for sure, but same same. The fight against Basilius and Echidna though is an incredible fight that actually killed me a couple of times. The mixture of the pitch black arena, multiple enemies with different things to worry about, it all just makes for a tense and utterly enthralling battle. Basilius is a threat as is, dealing a lot of damage and quick, he dashes everywhere, you can lose him quickly, it all just makes for a battle that keeps you on the edge of your seat, and then with all of this, you have to worry about the enormous spider attacking you too that you have to listen out for whilst avoiding Basilius. One of my favourite fights in the game. 
great, great fun. Then after this, we return to that spectacle mixed with a bit more challenge with the Wailing Host. This Cthulhu-esque behemoth is more visually stimulating than outright difficult, but can definitely deal some damage quick. The bigger the foe, the less combat orientated they usually are though, and that's definitely the case here. Bad, badass boss visually, but I think that carries this fight because it can drag a tad with its massive health bar. Next is Jamara the Scribe, who is another tough fight, a theme going forward, that again took me a couple of tries to get right. He more or less is a stationary target, but does massive damage and quick, so you really need to optimize those abilities, dodges, and attacking often, but retreating when needed to. Jamara is a true test and good fun to boot, but then straight after we battle against the Archon, which whooped my ass a few times. Something about the Angels, they just give me a tough time, and Archon is no exception. He has a big health pool, deals big damage, is quick and covers ground quickly, and just puts you on the edge immediately. There are phases in this fight that are more sit and wait, but man, you need it just to recover. Archon is another top tier fight, maybe the best in the game. We're coming to the end now, I promise. The second last battle is against the one, the only, Samael, who isn't as challenging as I'd hoped. He is tough, don't get it twisted, and maybe the Archon fight finally whooped my ass into place, playstyle wise, but I just thought he'd be harder for some reason. Nevertheless, Samael is a truly epic fight that fans were waiting to happen in the original, and it is more a test of skill than anything, so I'll give it a good ol' enjoyable, but not one of the best. Our final fight is against Absalon, who again is definitely challenging and requires your full attention with sweeping big damage attacks, but I just never found myself worried about defeat, though I was pretty kitted out by this point. A super solid fight to round out the main story though, and great fun, I just would have liked it if the Archon or something similar in challenge was the final hurdle, but that's just me. That's just the main bosses in Darksiders 2, without talking about the wealth of others, but look, Overall, they all do what bosses should do. Either provide a test of your abilities and show the full potential of the combat, or provide a great set piece and spectacle that couldn't be achieved otherwise. And Darksiders 2 nails both of these criteria and then some. Again, not every single battle is a winner, but more often than not, they're just great fun and frequent injections of bad ass, which is always welcome in Darksiders. But as always, and especially in regards to Darksiders 2, there is so much more than just the combat here. In fact, the combat at times can feel quite spaced out depending on what you decide to do in this vast world. Now, the original Darksiders did have an open-esque world to explore. Explore, but Darksiders 2 took that and said, nah, let's just do an open world. You have a couple of different realms separated by teleporters, but the two main open environments are the Forge Lands and the Kingdom of the Dead, in which you have a decent sized area to explore, ride around and find anything from collectibles, dungeons, side quests and secrets that all make this world feel so great to be in and begs to be explored. There are a couple of drawbacks in this design, one that ties into a larger point I want to make at the end of this segment, but another is in regards to the dungeons. Now the dungeons are still so tightly designed. They incorporate all the different gameplay elements like puzzles, platforming, and combat beautifully. They're a pure joy to explore and progressively figure out and conquer, but with the open world and the massive amount of dungeons means they can feel repetitive. A lot of dungeons do rely on being there done that mechanics like riding atop these constructs a bit too much for example. Some dungeons feel similar to explore to one another due to the locales not really changing all that much, that sort of thing. Again, they're great fun and much like the original are still one of the highlights of the whole gameplay experience, but they aren't as memorable as say the cathedral or as challenging as the black throne. Just in terms of memorability, I 
I don't recall these dungeons as much as the previous game and I think that's because of how many dungeons there are here. Whilst we're on dungeons, I think it's probably about time I talked about the platforming and puzzles. Platforming wise, mostly it's a great improvement and far more involved in the gameplay loop than before. We now have a wall run and the ability to climb on beams, but we lose the double jump and floating from before, which is a shame for sure, but overall, this simple change and how much more the platforming is involved is a great time. I enjoyed the various platforming challenges and figuring out ways to find secrets around this world, but I do have one issue that annoyed me during the time platforming challenges. Wall running when you wanted to climb up and vice versa. Sometimes death will sort of do his own thing and during these intense moments when it happens, it's infuriating. It's not all the time, but it happened enough to a point of annoyance, but mostly it isn't make or break luckily. Puzzle wise, as I said in the dungeons, the solutions can be the same a bit too often. Some are really engaging, like personally, getting the lanterns to progress involved more platforming and puzzling, which I really enjoyed. Or the portal puzzles in the Citadel are true brain teasers that involve so many different elements. But those bolder constructs do appear too much for my liking. Nevertheless though, puzzles are still great and an engaging break from combat that whilst at times similar, are still a lot of fun to figure out. Before I dive back into the open world mechanics and that second issue I was talking about though, I do want to take this time to talk about something that, well I don't often talk about, and that is the incredible soundtrack. Darksiders 2 has one of my favourite soundtracks in gaming. It's just a beautiful complement to the gameplay and frequently, especially in the Forge Lands, gives me that feeling of exploring Middle Earth. It can be very Lord of the Rings like, which for me is a quick way to my heart. There are a lot of moments in combat and moments of exploration that wouldn't work as well as they do without this stellar OST and it needs to be appreciated more. Okay, back to that open world now. So here's the thing. This world is incredible. Riding around on despair and exploring the various tombs, dungeons, finding underwater caverns, side characters, side missions, and those side missions leading to interesting objectives or boss encounters. I loved being in this world and trying to do everything I could, or at least that interested me. Things like the crucible and those waves and waves of enemies aren't my thing personally, but for the most part, I wanted to experience everything this game had to offer. The world is just designed with a great sense of wonder and with a great flow to exploration that I honestly thought, I wanna do everything I can in this game. It all just meshed together so damn well between the various gameplay mechanics and improvements and the vast worlds to explore it was incredible but then i noticed that difference in my gaming preferences between 2012 and 2022. open world games can captivate my attention like no other at least if they're good but they also lose my attention in an instant back in the day if it was an open world it was an immediate positive, but now, yeah, not so much. I loved this world and everything I was doing in it, but around the 20 to 25 hour mark, I just lost all interest. That's what I mean by issue, because it's more of a me thing, but I only have a certain amount of time in these games without a main objective where I'm compelled to keep playing, and once that time's up, it's up. It's for this reason that I only checked out one of the DLCs on offer. It was a great dungeon and all of that with a fun boss battle, but I was just done playing Darksiders 2 at this point. I can't emphasize enough that it's not because the game changed at all, or the side content became less interesting. It's just a personal thing I have now where I'll play a 6 to 10 hour experience for hours and hours, but the more open a game is, I just can't keep that same enthusiasm. As much as I love Darksiders 2 and everything it had to offer, I did just hit a brick wall and had to call it because the game is too good for my last memory of the game to be, well, forcing myself to keep playing. So overall, Darksiders 2's gameplay was incredible. 
The combat feels fast, is constantly putting you at the edge of your seat. The challenge is much improved. The loot system keeps combat fresh with such frequency that it never gets old. The world is a pure joy to explore. The dungeons are at times repetitive, but are still one of the highlights of the whole game. The bosses are a lot more engaging than before. The soundtrack beautifully goes off of the gameplay. It all is just top tier. Yes, I did lose interest eventually, but for 20 or so hours, I loved being in this world and playing this game. And that, for me, shows how special Darksiders 2 really is. So, was Darksiders 2 as good as I remembered? Of course, I mean, if you didn't guess that by now, I don't know what you've been listening to. Whether it be the story giving further backstory and creating a protagonist in death who is so compelling, the gameplay improvements and changes that work for the better in so many ways and feel like the definitive Darksiders experience. Whatever it may be, in almost every aspect you look at, Darksiders 2 is what any great sequel should be. They definitely mixed up the formula, but not in an alienating way. It still feels like it has the essence of what made the original great, but expands upon and builds on it in ways that only seem to improve it. Yes, eventually I did tap out on Darksiders 2, but that's not because the game was worse, I just am not into that sort of experience for as long, at least, anymore. At the end of the day though, revisiting your favourite game or perceived favourite game in a series isn't always a smash hit. I mean, look at Resistance 2. But Darksiders 2 absolutely lived up to my own expectations and then some. I strongly recommend, if you've never played Darksiders 2, play it. You don't have to play the rest of the series, but you should play Darksiders 2. It's just a great game in its own right, and you see so many videos, or at least I do, about people finally playing it and loving it. It's well worth your time, new or returning player. Go play Darksiders 2. Alright? That's the video. A lot happened in between the release of Darksiders 2 and 3, including... Well, all the fans believing Darksiders was done for good after the closure of Visual Games just five months after the release of Darksiders 2, and publishers uninterested in picking up the license from THQ. As a fan of the Darksiders series, this was a gut punch because, well, as I said in my Darksiders 2 retrospective, it's one of my favourite games of all time. And also, we'd only seen two out of the four horsemen, and I wanted to see what they would do with Fury and Strife. But as with any series, no matter how much you love it, a blow like that usually means a series is just done, and you move on. You can imagine my surprise then when four years later, the reveal trailer for Darksiders 3 dropped this time developed by Gunfire Games, a new studio who were founded by David Adams, one of the first developers who started working on Darksiders at Vigil Games. But back in 2017, I didn't care about any of that. I was just so happy to see Darksiders was officially back. I pre-ordered the game on the spot and waited patiently until November 2018, when after six long years, I finally got to continue my Darksiders journey. And yeah, I was pretty disappointed with the game. I just found myself getting bored in Darksiders 3. I wasn't big on the Souls-like change of direction, and all I could do was compare the game to Darksiders 2, which it just didn't stack up. That hype train is an unpredictable beast, but more often than not, it does lead to disappointment, which sometimes isn't always the game's fault. Lofty expectations building over years, it'll warp your perception, and it's why I'm actually really excited to revisit Darksiders 3 today. When you revisit a game that you found disappointing, especially due to hype, what happens when you go back and give the game a second go is, more often than not, it is better than you remember. And that's why I love coming back to these sorts of games. So, after finally revisiting Darksiders 3, the question is pretty simple. Is Darksiders 3 better than I remembered? Let's find out.
Darksiders 3's story takes place parallel to the events of Darksiders 2 and before most of the original Darksiders and sees our protagonist Fury, one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, summoned by the Charred Council, who task her with hunting down the seven deadly sins who have escaped their imprisonment. To be sure Fury sticks to her mission, the Council assign Fury a Watcher and we head to the war-torn, post-apocalyptic Earth. Pretty much immediately after arriving on Earth, Fury encounters and defeats the first of the Sins, Envy, and claims her talisman to use as a prison to hold her and the rest of the Sins. Along Fury's travel, she finds a sanctuary named Haven where she meets a maker named Ulthane, as well as a small surviving group of humans. Ulthane asks Fury to send back any humans she finds on her mission to Haven, pleading that their lives are worth saving. Fury then leaves and soon after finds the next sin, Wrath, who mortally wounds the horseman after she's distracted by the sudden death of her horse, Rampage. Fury is saved when a portal opens up below her and takes her to the Lord of the Hollows, a powerful being with the ability to release beings from the cycle of life, death and rebirth in the Well of Souls. The Lord heals Fury and reveals that she is being manipulated by the Charred Council for their own personal schemes. He then gifts her with a mystical artifact known as the Fire Hollow, which enhances her combat prowess and after various sins being hunted down and captured, the Lord of Hollows gifts Fury with more and more special hollows in Storm, Force and Stasis. Once we have captured six of the seven sins, we finally face off against and defeat the final sin, Pride, who reveals that the Council have been secretly betraying their so-called balance behind everyone's back since the beginning. It's at this point where the Watcher reveals herself to be the real Envy, tricking Fury and the Council to strengthen herself by absorbing the rest of the sins into her amulet, gaining all their powers. Envy uses her talisman to immobilize Fury and takes her powers as well, telling her that the Council tried to pit the Horsemen against the Sins in hopes they'd annihilate each other. Fury then swiftly falls to the Earth, but is saved by the humans she had rescued along the way, and Ulthane reveals that he has constructed a gateway that allows Fury to confront both Envy and the Council. Fury then heads through the portal, arrives at the council chambers, and defeats Envy. The council almost immediately after turn on the rider who holds off their attacks by detonating the talisman of sin and retreats back to earth. Once back on earth, Fury helps the makers defend the humans escaping through the reflecting pool to another realm whilst Haven is attacked by demons. Fury, without a mission or purpose anymore, decides to follow the humans as their new protector, asking Ulthane to help her brother War if he ever comes across him. Before Fury can leave through the portal, she notices one of the humans helping to defend the Makers from the attack, who is quickly revealed to be Strife in disguise, another one of the horsemen. In an after credit scene, it is revealed through another conversation between Lilith and Lucifer that they know Fury has gone to protect the humans, and depending on your choices in game, he is either livid or cocky that his plans are in danger or going as planned. And that's the story for Darksiders 3. First things first, as you may be able to tell from the length of this synopsis, the story isn't a primary focus in regards to the Darksiders 3 package, but then again, there is a lot more story to this game that either I didn't personally experience, or they are story moments that build character more than progress the story forward, if you know what I mean. Before I jump into that though, I do want to say, I really enjoyed the story here quite a bit. It has its flaws and loose ends that never tie up, at least to my knowledge. Like seriously, what the hell happened to Rampage? They built it up, constantly brought it into the limelight through the dialogue between Fury and the Sins, and then just blue-balled me on that one, which was a letdown. But overall, the story ended up being something I really enjoyed about Darksiders 3, which was not the case from the start. In the beginning, Fury isn't a likeable protagonist, and whilst that doesn't need to be a requirement in some game stories, the more unlikable your character is, the less I want to listen to them talk. 
Now, don't get me wrong, I understand why Gunfire Games made this decision, and I do want to say, I loved where her character ended up by the end of Darksiders 3 and that path of character growth. But much like her name suggests, in the beginning, probably up until just before Lust, she is just this vessel of hatred and anger that I personally am okay with, but just not for half the game. Again, I get it, the character description is sort of in the name, but when compared to War or Death, their character wasn't defined by destruction or, well, death. They had more subtleties and more depth to their characters that Fury eventually has as well, but in my opinion, it just takes a little too long to get there. I understand the vengeance and anger for moments like Rampage's death or the constant flaunting of his corpse, but most of the time she comes off as arrogant, which just isn't an enjoyable trait to have in a primary protagonist. As I said though, she does improve vastly from Lust onwards, and it's from here where the story truly sank its hooks into me and didn't let go. I mean, you have moments like the illusion with all four of the horsemen together, which, whilst an illusion, is no less awesome. Fury's mercy and empathy when it comes to the angel, Usiel. After he succumbs to the illusions of lust, her growing relationship with the humans feels natural and truly makes her character, by the end, feel like a selfless protector. I think you notice the change in Fury the most between the two battles against Wrath. The first fight, she's, as I described, arrogant and angry with not much else to her character, but near the end of this journey and the second encounter with Wrath, you notice just how far she has come. One, she's a likeable character who I wanted to hear her speak, but she doesn't blindly rely on anger to battle and comes in more clear-headed in combat. And even when Fury does express anger or, well, Fury in the later parts of the game, again, it's not her only emotion or trait and it's understandable why she feels this way. Like facing off against Envy who used her or saving the council only to be betrayed once she questions their intentions of upholding the balance. Fury can be angry, but it plays out much, much better when that's not all she is. And when it was all said and done, I ended up loving her as a protagonist. There is more to this story than what I went over in the synopsis though. I mean, the dialogue between the Sins and Fury alone is filled with story primarily related to the Council and why they're not to be trusted. Fans already knew this, but Fury doesn't, and they delve out more and more information in this arc really well, which is why when you stumble across the Sins, you're excited not only to see what Gunfire Games depicted them as, but what story they add to the table. There is a big piece of story I missed in my playthrough of Darksiders 3 though, and that is in regards to the Lord of the Chosen and finding the demon Abraxas. This omission on my behalf and play not knowing about it is probably due to my lack of investment in the story at that point in the game, but I just had no idea this was a thing that apparently has some big implications in the story. Abraxas forewarns Fury about the Destroyer and gifting Abraxas' soul to the Lord gives you a mysterious talisman that the Council and Lucifer are deathly afraid of. Not gonna lie, learning about this little quest arc made me want to jump back into Darksiders 3 on New Game Plus to see what was going on, but a pretty cool side story that expands the world for well, players who pay attention. As I've said in other retrospectives for Darksiders though, what really engages me in these stories is good characters. And whilst they aren't all incredible, most of them are pretty damn engaging. The Seven Sins are really interesting, and again, add a lot of intrigue and right type of questioning that makes their inevitable boss fight all the sweeter after the incessant taunting. The Watcher, or Fury, has this weird vibe of admiration from the beginning, and whilst the twist ending of her being Fury is surprising, you can see her character changing from admiration to almost disgust through Fury changing in attitude. She adds a lot to Fury's character, which is really well done. Volgram's back and in a more talkative manner than 2, which is great, though he talks about the Crucible, 
too much after a while. I'm not playing the Crucible Volgrim, leave me be. Ulthine and his mission to help the humans is admirable. The Charred Council are finally shown to be this hypocritical entity we've known they were since the original. Usiel and his uneasy alliance with Fury is a dynamic not seen since Darksiders 1, which I thought was a nice throwback. The Lord of the Chosen is this mysterious figure that whilst didn't expand as much for me, is still compelling enough to just sit and listen, and again, seeing all the horsemen together was amazing. But how about that Strife reveal? Ends up making a lot more sense when that human was questioning Fury in the beginning, and then the badass introduction? Love it. Made me excited to play Genesis. Look, overall, the story does have flaws. It's not perfect, nor does it add as much to the backstory as, say, Darksiders 2. But when this story sunk its hooks in, it never let go. I really did end up enjoying this story a lot, even if it begins on average grounds. It's not as deep or ever-present as the previous entries, but the characters are really interesting and the task is simple, but Fury evolves nicely through this journey. The sins are compelling, taunting Fury in their own unique ways, and the badass moments are just as incredible as ever if not better. Again, loose ends, plot holes, that sort of thing are here, and the story doesn't feel as fleshed out as other entries. But for a more simplistic story skeleton, primarily focused on creating badass boss fights, I did have a lot of fun with this story. It may not be the best, but it certainly is enjoyable, and the story can be more or less complex depending on your choices and what you find in this world, which is a storytelling component I do love to see. Okay, let's get this out of the way right now. Does Darksiders 3 feel like I'm playing a Darksiders game? Not particularly. Do I think that makes Darksiders 3 a bad game then? No, I don't. Darksiders 3's gameplay is very different from the rest of the series, even though at its core it still contains a lot of those same pillars. Hack and slash combat, platforming and puzzles are still present in Darksiders 3, but they use very differently. Now I'm not saying Darksiders ever really had a formula, I mean the changes between the original and the sequel showed that this series evolves and changes with each horseman. But they never ventured off from the Zelda meets God of War path quite like Darksiders 3. Darksiders 3 feels like you're playing a Souls-like but with more Metroidvania mechanics. Dungeons are essentially gone, even though the locales still at times feel like they have that same sort of vibe. That dungeon path of progression is also gone, mixing in combat, platforming and puzzles far less. Darksiders 3 is very combat centric. You don't get as lengthy a break between combat encounters, and really, the game is focused on you finding those seven sins which are highlighted through a navigation bar. Your objective through the various locations is also much different from before because of the heavy combat and souls-like systems. You're scouring the environments to find various shards, upgrade materials, souls to level up, finding shortcuts to make death less of a hassle. In short, before diving into all these changes in depth, Darksiders 3 feels quite alien to the fans of the series. I do not think that makes Darksiders 3 a bad game though, because I actually really enjoyed my time playing through this game. I do think it fails though in being a Darksiders game, or at least feeling like a Darksiders experience. It's just a bit too different. This is a point I'll elaborate on further, but for now, enough teasing and let's dive into the gameplay, starting off with combat. First things first in regards to Darksiders 3's combat. I think it meshes Souls-like and Darksiders S combat really really well. When the enemies allow for it, mostly in the early portion of the game, Darksiders 3's combat feels right at home with the rest of the series. Fury's Whip is a badass and unique weapon that is both speedy 
has good range and deals a solid amount of damage. You end up with 4 extra weapons all with unique movesets and wrath abilities. You still have your myriad of combinations that are tied to timing button presses. A fury mode, all those sorts of things that made up Darksiders style of combat are still here. Maybe even more so if you play the game on Classic, I believe, which changes combat to a more Darksiders style apparently. Though I personally didn't check it out so I can't comment on how this affects combat. The early game combat compared to the late game though is very different, which I believe was done to ease fans into the Souls-like fashion of combat. One of the big differences here in Darksiders 3's combat is the way enemies behave, which in turn forces the player to change how they react. Enemies this time around come in all shapes and sizes, but more so in regards to their methods of attack. Some are group or swarm-like, some sit back and block, others can tank through damage not interrupting their own attack animations, some wait for counters, and others are just big beefy bastards. So your approach to combat in Darksiders 3 is very different. Sometimes it's go go go, others it's stay close and utilize iframes through dodging, some require a bigger hit to break their block, or just wait around and counter, but in general the combat is much more methodical and slower paced. Yes, there are bursts of speed, but mostly you're waiting for your enemies to give you an opening. This sense of danger is also heightened through the limited health pool shards having a cooldown before using another, and that threat of death meaning you need to backtrack all the way up to where you were if you had a few souls on you when you died. Again, the combat itself, such as your attacks with the whip or any of the different hollow weapons, in essence are much like before, but it's the way you play and that threat of death that changes how you play this time around. I really enjoyed how this combat functioned, which I know might not be a surprise to fans of the channel who know I'm a massive Souls fan. But that doesn't mean Souls likes are an easy genre to pull off, and I think in regards to the combat in Darksiders 3, they succeeded. It's by no means the most challenging Souls-like or even the most challenging of the series. In fact, I think I died more in Darksiders 2. But that tense feeling you get when you're near death and need to find some breathing room is no less stressful and the enemies do a good job at keeping you on your toes and constantly teaching you different ways of approaching foes in battle. Learning how these enemies move and attack is just satisfying because when you start learning these moves and knowing them and that muscle memory kicks in, you're dodging, dealing big damage with counters, using all your resources, when you have encounters that just flow so beautifully, barely getting a scratch, not only does it make you feel like one of the horsemen, but it gets your blood pumping, wanting to see if you can do it again, but better. The flow of combat when you put your full arsenal into it is something that is incredibly fun and satisfying because you can be punished for silly mistakes or lapse in concentration just as easily. It's that sort of fair punishment, the type where if you get hit or even die, usually you're blaming yourself and not the game because the enemy encounters have been lessened in number. They telegraph their attacks well and outside of a few enemies like the big shielded ones, feel like they leave enough openings and counter options that if you do get hit, will look out for what's going on. I will say the Storm Wrath ability does impact enemy visibility a little too much, which is a shame as I think it's the best one in the game, but I need to be able to see what my enemy is doing in this type of game. In regards to the combat or combat preparation, as I said, you can find or purchase both shards and upgrade materials around the world or from Volgrim. These shards come in the form of health, wrath, fury, fortification, undying, and a few others that I personally rarely use to help you stay as combat efficient as possible in the longer encounters or boss fights. These shards do have a 10 second cooldown, so if you need to heal and are out of your Nephilim, respite, essentially your Estus Flask, you need to be aware that you won't be able to do much else for another 10 seconds. I actually really like this cooldown because you end up with so many of these different shards that if you could just keep popping them, the combat would be stupidly easy. But with the cooldown, you end up stressing out a lot more and strategizing about what needs to be done first. 
Fury is often a good option as you get invincibility, quick attacks and health regen, but the shards are much rarer. So maybe you go for fortification to lessen the impact of the harder hitting foes, but you're still taking damage. It's these sorts of decisions that make the combat encounters much more engaging and adds another strategic element on top of the slower paced combat. As for the upgrade materials, you can increase the number of your Nephilim's respite, how much health they recover. Talismans that you can equip to your weapons can be upgraded with either angelic or demonic artifacts that increase specific stats. And weapon wise, well, upgrading those means they deal more damage. You can also spend your souls at Volgrim to level up and put a point into either health, physical or arcane damage. The RPG mechanics aren't as deep as say Darksiders 2 but it feels right at home in the Souls-like genre and these rewards and wanting to power up your combat powers is enough to want to go out, explore and gather souls, materials and shards. The big reason you want to be as prepared combat wise as possible is for those boss encounters. Again, they aren't all the most challenging fights, but they can put you in your place if you aren't prepared or lapse in concentration. They are all good fun and satisfying to conquer though. There's no big like, yes, moment where the boss had whooped you over and over again, but some definitely made me try again and go in more prepared. They're a good time above all else though. Now there are bosses outside of the Seven Sins, which are again a good time, but today I want to focus on the Sins because I didn't face every boss in this world, and whilst the battles I found were good fun and some tough fights, the Sins are the cream of the crop. As is often the case, the first boss fight against Envy isn't anything special. I mean, it is literally after about 10 minutes of playing the game, so tutorial boss definitely applies. Envy has big attack cues, involves some platforming tutorials, and overall is a pretty easy fight. Given my health bar doesn't say that, but that's because I get falling in the platforming segments, which pertains to an issue I'll touch on when it comes to the puzzles and platforming. But yeah, solid tutorial fight. Good way to ease players into the combat. The second sin we encounter is against Wrath, who we actually fight twice. The fights are pretty similar from one another, so I'm going to go over both now. Wrath is a decent sized hulking boss, but he's deceptively quick. He's a great boss for the early game as he packs a punch, has fair attack timings and can be easily punished, but you can just as easily be punished. The arena is a nice size to make for a tense encounter and in general, we're still only about an hour into the game, so he makes for a great dodging and countering tutorial. When we encounter him again, it is in this large arena. He starts off much bigger than before and can regain health through killing enemies. By this point though, he is a piece of cake. You can easily wail on him, do enough damage to make regen irrelevant, but it is satisfying to finally conquer him after all this time. Wrath overall is another good fight, but the lack of tools in the first fight definitely makes it more tense than later in the game. The next sin, I'm going off these in the order I believe you find them in, but you might be able to mix up the order. The next sin we come up against is Avarice, who is an entertaining battle, but sort of simple. Avarice has a massive arena and utilizes height to his advantage, but his windups for attack are very, very obvious. He is a counter-attack's wet dream. Again, still a fun fight, but predictable. Then we have a battle against the Sin Sloth, who, if I was to compare a fight, he feels a bit like the Asylum Demon. He doesn't have many attacks, mainly slamming and swinging his stick club, but he does enough damage to worry you and make you cautious of becoming overconfident. Again, wind-ups are simple to nail down, dodge and counter for the win. I wasn't as prepared for this battle as some of the others, so this was a tense battle for me, but not too bad overall. Then we come up against the Sin Lust, and about halfway through also have to battle the Angel Usiel. This battle is probably the player's first 
true test, or at least that's how I felt, because Lust is no joke. She's quick, loves to dash around, jump about, spin and slicing attacks that have smaller windows to dodge. She is a serious threat, and then you pair her up with an albeit slower boss in Uziel, but he still hits like a truck, and you have to worry about both attacking you. This fight is so much fun though. Lust doesn't have this massive health pool, but you have less opportunity to attack her, so it makes for this great chess match. Big enough arena to feel like you can get some space, but she covers ground quickly too, so it feels like a good size. Tense but extremely fun battle that had me on the edge of my seat, even with as many resources as I could spare. The next battle is against the Sin Gluttony, who... Yeah, he got me a few times. He just doesn't have a lot of chances to hit him, so you need to make sure you're getting space from his big arena length attacks, but coming back just as quickly to deal some damage. He hits like an absolute truck too. After phase one though, we go to phase two, which is really just swimming around and waiting for him to inhale a bomb. Sort of a lackluster ending to the fight after the struggle of phase one. As much as I enjoy a good challenge though, I do think Gluttony doesn't give the play enough of an opportunity to get hit forcing the player to circle and circle for a bit too long. Don't get me wrong, it's tense, but just not executed perfectly. Enjoyable and challenging, just not amazing. Next up is the Sin Pride, who is very similar to Lust in speed, but this time she has access to magic and ranged attacks, a constant laser in the arena, and a shield to break on top of that. This is a tense edge of your seat battle. She again doesn't have a wealth of health, but with that shield, her quick attacks, magic homing missiles, a laser beam, it makes it hard to deal too much damage before retreating. Nice size arena, well telegraphed attacks, just good old fashioned challenge that puts you to the test. Probably my favourite fight in the game alongside Lust. I love this fight. And lastly we have, well, the real Envy. Envy has a ton of attacks at her disposal. She has guns, a scythe, a blade, can summon the other sins to deal a special attack. She does have a good amount of wind up to her attacks though, and if I'm honest, I probably sweat more in the pride fight. She can put you in your place, don't get me wrong, but she leaves herself wide open and is easily counted, leaving her exposed for a good few hits. I did really enjoy this battle, but it for me wasn't the peak of the boss's difficulty. Great fun though. Once again, there are more bosses than just the Sins to face off against, but in regards to the main battles, I think the Sins are a lot of fun to hunt down and defeat. Some took me a few tries, others were a one and done, but they were all satisfying to defeat and still stick to that Darksiders theme of badass boss fights. As I mentioned in the beginning of this segment though, combat does take up a majority of your journey to find and capture the seven sins, which means the platforming and puzzles took the hit in terms of how present they are in the Dark Side's formula. Don't get me wrong, they are still here. You'll still have those moments of just puzzles, like one of my favorites involving the tornado forcing you into the subway system and forcing blocks to move out of place, or the platforming moments like when you gain the force hollow and can platform underwater. I'm not saying they're gone, but they just aren't as involved, more so used in ways to further explore and do side activities, like figuring out how to use one of the beetles to unlock a secret, or freezing certain death traps to fall below and grab something awesome. You have different hollows that affect both platforming and puzzles, like lava or fire traversal, walking on water, floating up into the air, a super jump, a supercharged slam, hover, a rock ball and wall jump but they aren't really used the same way they were before. We don't have these dungeons anymore. The locales feel similar to dungeons to explore, use platforming and puzzles to progress, but they are more so used to explore the locales fully and find secrets and upgrades. The world is designed in a more Metroidvania style. You unlock more and more abilities, but mostly they're for optional locales like the underwater city, which is completely optional, but by far one of the most stunning environments in the game. It's this world and the way you explore, the reason you explore, and how the platforming and puzzles are pushed to the side though that makes Darksiders 3 feel like Darksiders adjacent. The combat at its core feels similar. The way you explore the world, puzzles and platforming, all that stuff is like Darksiders, but the Souls-like aspects push that formula to the side in favour of 
well, souls. Again, the world is a pure joy to explore, the locales are stunning, the combat is good fun, the bosses are great tests of your combat abilities, the platforming is satisfying aside from the grapple hook swing not working at times, and the puzzles, whilst repetitive with a lot of block slamming, after you unlock the force hollow, are still enjoyable. Darksiders 3 is a game I really enjoyed playing. Honestly, it just for reasons I can't exactly put my finger on doesn't feel like a Darksiders experience. It might be the lack of dungeons or the heavy combat focus, but whilst fun, something about Darksiders 3 just doesn't quite meet those Darksiders series expectations. So, was Darksiders 3 better than I remembered? Hell yeah it was. I thoroughly enjoyed my time playing Darksiders 3. I really loved this story and Fury's character arc. I loved the combat and the more Souls-like approach. The bosses are tense and engaging battles. The platforming is vast and varied. The puzzles can be at times brain teasers and the locales are stunning. I think Darksiders 3 is a good game. I just don't think it's a great Darksiders game. It has the pillars of the Darksiders formula right. It at times captures this series formula in a new way, but mostly it just feels like this game could have been called something else because it doesn't feel exactly a part of the series. Again, it's like Darksiders-esque. It doesn't feel like a spin-off or anything like that, and I'm not saying a series can't change or I wouldn't like to see the series tackle the Souls-like genre again but I wouldn't mind seeing them return to Darksiders 2 either. I'm just conflicted, I think. I loved playing this game, and I really did enjoy all 9 or so hours with the game and exploring as much as possible. I don't know how to explain it. Something about the game just feels off when compared to the series. With all this talk about is it a good Darksiders game versus a good game, at the end of the day, does that matter? Does it matter if at the end of the day the game is still enjoyable? That answer is up to you. On its own though, or just critiquing the game by itself, I do recommend giving Darksiders 3 a go, especially if you're looking for a nice Souls-like. I truly did enjoy my time playing through this game. I do not think it's a bad game or even an average game, and whatever the next 3D hack and slasher in the series may be, I'm excited to see where Gunfire Games takes it. But for now, we just have one more game in the series to go, and well, this one changes up the series quite a lot on the surface. Here we are once again, the end of another series of retrospectives. We've covered the greats and well, still the pretty damn goods, but now we're finally here. The conclusion to the Darksiders series so far, Darksiders Genesis. Now, I made it no secret in my video on Darksiders 3 that back in 2018, I was left pretty disappointed by Darksiders return to the gaming sphere. I didn't think it was a bad game, but at the time, it just was not my cup of tea. And so, when I first saw Darksiders Genesis's reveal trailer in mid-2019, I'll be honest, my first thought was, what the hell is this? Finally, a game with the final horsemen, and we get this spin-off that looked like they traded in the formula to pursue some Diablo-esque game. Despite that reaction though, I did still pick up Darksiders Genesis day one with, you know, those abysmally low expectations. I didn't know what I was getting myself into, but I was certain it was going to be yet another disappointing entry in the Darksiders series. Well, I was completely wrong, because whilst it took me a mission or two to get into the game, I truly adored playing Genesis. I loved the story, the gameplay still felt like a true Darksiders experience despite the change of perspective, and really, I was just completely wrong about what sort of game I was getting myself into. Yes, it has that Diablo inspiration at times, but above all, this is a Darksiders experience. It wasn't this careless spin-off or afterthought to keep the franchise present in people's minds. This was an honest-to-god great Darksiders journey and one of my favourite games to release in 2019. But will I feel the same way about it today? 
I know two going on three years isn't a whole heap of time between playthroughs or since release, I mean we've covered games 20 years old at this point, but what excited me the most about revisiting Darksiders Genesis today was two factors that weren't present the first time around. First of all, the rest of the series was almost but a distant memory, with the clearest point of reference being the disappointed feeling I was left with by Darksiders 3, which I've since gone on to revisit and really enjoyed. And secondly, do I think this game is as incredible without well, terrible expectations going in. Now that I finally finished revisiting Darksiders Genesis, it's time to put all that love and praise I just went over to the test and answer, is Darksiders Genesis as good as I remember? Let's find out. As the name implies, Darksiders Genesis is set, well, at the beginning, before the events of the previous three games. The game is set at some point soon after the Horsemen were gifted their powers from the Charred Council in exchange for annihilating their own kind in the Nephilim in what ended up being a bloody battle on Eden. After this battle, War and Strife are once again summoned by the Council being tasked with a new mission. The Council suspects the Demon King Lucifer is planning something evil that involves the Demon Lord Samael that threatens to upset the balance. So the Council sends Strife and War to investigate. Upon invading Samael's keep, the two horsemen find it under attack from another Master of Hell, though apparently a lesser one, Moloch. Samael tells our duo that he is not in on Lucifer's plan and hence has resulted in this attack. Before he can elaborate though, Moloch attacks and Samael transports the horsemen to the void in order to speak with his associate, Volgrim. In the void, Volgrim informs War and Strife that he can help them track down Lucifer, but he requires several artifacts. So once we go out and gather all those bits and bobs, Volgrim tells the horsemen that Lucifer has paid a visit to another master of hell, Mammon. At this point, Samael enters the void and suggests that the horsemen find Mammon and force him to talk about Lucifer and his plans. When our duo find Mammon, they see he has several relics and weapons from Eden, and after killing him, the horsemen return to Volgrim and Samael and learn exactly how Mammon got his hands on those types of treasures. Lucifer has opened a path to Eden and is turning its sacred water and turning it into poison. The demon Belial is is the head of this operation, so we go out, stop him, but spare him from death because he actually gave them some information. After the horsemen leave though, Lucifer arrives and punishes Belial anyway, so probably wished he'd just been finished off by the horsemen. From Belial's information though, Strife and War learned that Dagon, the drowned king, is another demon under Lucifer's umbrella who has been offered Eden in exchange for his help. When the horsemen arrive on Eden, we quickly meet Abaddon, the guardian angel of Eden. It's from Abaddon we learn that Lucifer is spreading corruption in Eden and asks for their help in cleansing Eden. So that's what we do along the way, tracking down and killing Dagon. We return to the Void where Samael advises us to destroy the source of Moloch's power before they attack him, as he was much more powerful than he had any right being when he faced off with Samael. They do exactly that, and with Samael, Strife and War attack and kill Moloch, but before he dies, Moloch tells the horsemen that Lucifer's plan is already finished, and Samael knows what it is. Returning to the Void once more, Samael tells us that Lucifer had asked for the souls of the Masters of Hell in exchange for their services. He also mentions that Lilith is plotting with Lucifer as well, and together they created an artifact called the Animus, which is fueled by the souls of both the Masters of Heaven and Hell, who had accepted Lucifer's offer. Said artifact is corrupting mankind on Earth as we speak, turning them into the volatile and self-destructive species they would grow to become later on. The horsemen head to Earth to find mankind living in sin and realize that they helped Lucifer achieve this. Lucifer talks to strife and war through a human child and tells us that the corruption of mankind is spreading and cannot be stopped. 
Afterwards, they return to the Chard Council who declare that mankind needs to be watched as a third kingdom. They then forge the Seven Seals as a treaty to uphold the balance between heaven and hell. Three of them coming from the demonic planes and three of them coming from the angelic keeps and one from the council itself. They declare whoever breaks the treaty shall suffer the wrath of the horsemen which sets the stage for the future games and that's the story for Darksiders Genesis. Okay I'm gonna get this out of the way before I start gushing over this story. The main story plot or general objective in Genesis is sort of meh. Lucifer's got a plan plan's bad for the balance so we need to try and stop it. I'll be honest the plot itself centering around Lucifer anyways isn't why I love this story. It sort of just gives us an excuse to go after and hunt down various demon lords in search of Lucifer. Nothing wrong with that but it's sort of what the main plot synopsis centered around and I don't think that's Genesis's story's strong point. This story's strength comes from strife and wars interactions. How they are processing the recent decimation of the Nephilim by their own hands. Dealing with the helpful, not so helpful demons in Samael and Volgrim, and learning about the aftermath of the Battle of Eden. Strife and War's relationship though really carries this story to great heights because their chemistry is just impeccable. Strife is just such a likeable protagonist and the way he goes back and forth with his brother in both a joking and banter sort of way and serious moments of reflection are great qualities that make me want to go out and find these extra dialogue opportunities. A lot of War and Strife's best moments of interaction aren't moments that every player is guaranteed to experience because they mostly are optional which I don't necessarily think was the right move because of how great these conversations between the two brothers are. Whether it's Strife poking fun at War for his lack of humour or the council's always right attitude to moments like when Strife is reflecting on the Battle of Eden and his regrets and questions and it's through these moments you really do connect with both the horsemen. Again, they're just really likeable and brilliantly performed by both Liam O'Brien and Chris Jai Alex and honestly, it's their story and how they deal with both the past and the present that truly invested me in this story as a whole. Speaking of performances, once again we just have an absolutely star-studded cast with the likes of Troy Baker returning as Abaddon, Phil Lamar and Vernon Wells back as Volgrim and Samael. Keith David's in this game as the Demon Lord Moloch. I'd need more Keith David in my video games. I mean the pedigree on display here is astounding and what I love most about these characters, both new and old, is they have so much more to work with. I've let it be known in my other videos on the series, but it's been a minute since the characters had that same swagger, same charisma as the characters of the original, and I think Genesis absolutely nailed it. We get more time with the demons Volgrim and Samael to further that feeling of, why exactly are they helping us because there is something funky going on here. There has to be. Samael and Volgrim are again such interesting characters and whilst being helpful again to strife and war, I do not trust them one bit. I'm literally just waiting for them to bite me in the ass but obviously being the beginning of the series that doesn't happen. As I said though, they just have that charisma and the fact that well, even though we don't trust them, we can't really do all that much without them. It's a great dynamic in the relationship between Horseman and Demon that all these years later is still compelling. I really enjoyed seeing Abaddon again and getting, even though slight, more backstory into his character and relationship with the Horseman. To Abaddon, they're just uber powerful Nephilim and after the Battle of Eden, yeah, he's not a fan, but through helping him rid corruption and poison from his home, he does ever so slightly warm up to you. Then you have the various demon lords who again are performed amazingly and provide further insight into our horseman or Lucifer and his plans. Look, if you couldn't tell, once again the characters in Genesis carry this story. The actual quest of stopping Lucifer is sort of whatever. I mean, it does a good job of setting up the world of Darksiders, which for a game titled Genesis is sort of a must, but whether it be War, Strife, Samael, Volgrim, Dis, the various angel and demon lords, 
whoever it may be. They are the compelling and intriguing aspect of this story and carry it to what is for me at least one of the standout stories in the series. Strive and War's relationship is just so damn interesting and engaging, it's hard for me not to just gush about the story. I do have one issue with Genesis though, or more or less the series as a whole, and that is what's next? We still haven't experienced any further story after the events of Darksiders 1, and we're four games deep at this point. I used to think it was because Vigil or Gunfire or Airship was setting up what the other horsemen were doing around the same time, but well, Genesis throws that out the window because we still don't really know what Strife had been up to except for his cameo in 3. I just think we can't keep going back in this series and Darksiders 4 is the perfect opportunity to continue the story from Darksiders 1 with all four of the horsemen. But that's more of a general series complaint than directly Genesis' issue and look, at the end of the day, again this story's primary purpose is to set up the gameplay and those badass moments, which it does perfectly. If I had to boil down what it feels like to play Darksiders Genesis, it would be very different to what you may think if you've never played it because at a glance, it looks Diablo-esque or maybe something like Torchlight, but that's not really the case. When you boil it down, Darksiders Genesis feels like a Darksiders game that you play from a top-down perspective. There are more changes than that obviously, and as is the case, the gameplay for this series already sort of changed from game to game due to how the horsemen play, but in its entirety. I feel very comfortable saying Genesis still feels like I'm playing Darksiders. You have the hack and slash combat, wrath and horseman abilities, platforming, puzzles to a limited extent, dungeons and big ol' boss fights. The pillars of the Darksiders formula are all still here and honestly, they're just as fun as ever. As was the case back when I played the game at release, it did take me a mission or two to fully invest into the gameplay, and I'm not saying it's perfect, but it's still a lot of fun to play, and despite the change in camera angle, it feels like it belongs in the Darksiders series. But I'm getting ahead of myself, so let's start the breakdown, as always, beginning with combat. Unlike the rest of the series, I have to break down two styles of combat in regards to Genesis because War and Strife do play very differently from one another. For this playthrough however, I did play solo and for that reason I did primarily stick to playing as Strife just because he is the new horseman and I would already played as War before. So let's get War's playstyle out of the way now and then I can dive deep into the changes Strife makes to Darksiders combat. War essentially is the war we remember playing in the original Darksiders. He's an up close and personal brawler, still has great hacking and slashing combinations with a few wrath abilities we've also seen before and his war mode, but now with the added bonus of these elemental effects that well, the descriptions in the name. They add fire or death touch to your attacks, that sort of thing. When you're participating in combat as war, it's very similar to the combat you remember from the original, just again with that top-down perspective. There's no crazy changes here. I didn't dislike playing as War, in fact, it's when playing as him that the Darksiders muscle memory sort of kicks in, but mostly what I said in my Darksiders retrospective applies in Genesis. Strife, on the other hand, is a very different beast compared to all the other horsemen we've played because his strength is ranged combat given his primary weapons are his two pistols, and it's through Strife where you could compare the combat to a bit more more of a twin stick shooter. Strife does have some close quarter combat options that progressively get stronger through buying combinations and upgrades through discs, but they aren't his strongest assets, which is evident through Strife's elemental upgrades being unique bullets. Whether it be electricity, shooting out black holes, a charged shot, laser beam, a sort of shotgun that causes enemies to also drop health on impact, lava shots, etc. On top of all this though, Strife is rewarded frequently for kills with almost a mega version of these bullets that, 
well, deal more damage or provide a quicker reload in between shots for bullets like the charge shots or a flamethrower or a compact shotgun or just being all around quicker to fire like the standard bullets. You have a lot of options in regards to Strife's combat, but primarily those options are focusing on the pistols and as a result, ranged combat. Strife's wrath abilities are further proof with one focusing on leaving a shadow clone behind to both damage and distract enemies so Strife can get to a safe distance or an uber laser beam that practically takes up the whole screen. Again, Strife isn't useless in close quarters and you can still hack, slash and dice up lesser enemies that way too. But that's sort of why you have war. In regards to how it feels to play as Strife though, it's amazing. The twin stick shooting is super solid and easy to snap from one enemy to another. Strife is quick but also elusive because again, through upgrades, if you time dodges perfectly, he can also leave a clone in his dust. The ability to have two different elements equipped at once means you can constantly change up how you attack at a distance, adding that much needed variety. Horse combat is back and honestly feels like a big old cheese to shoot enemies at a distance with seemingly more damage for whatever reason. But possibly the most badass element to Strife's combat is his ultimate mode. My god is this thing broken and I love it. You can decimate bosses health bars, obliterate hundreds of enemies in seconds and you know what, it feels great to be able to do that. Strife is not this tanky protagonist and if you're caught lacking, maybe get too comfortable closer range or aren't looking out for enemies cues or simply get swarmed, you are done. Strife is not exactly a glass cannon, but it's a different sort of feeling compared to the other horsemen. You want it to be close and personal with war, death and fury, so enemies in your face didn't have the same reaction as when enemies close in on Strife. When that happens, you need to be able to crowd control. Weave in and out of attacks, hoping to give yourself enough time to get good distance, which the enemies do not make easy. I'm not gonna sit here and say Darksiders Genesis is a necessarily difficult game because outside of the final boss, I didn't have both war and strife die causing a reset. But that doesn't mean Strife didn't take a fair few falls along the way. Obviously, I wasn't playing the ideal solo playstyle and let war handle more enclosed encounters and use Strife for when I need distance. I'd say that's your ideal playstyle if you're going at this game solo, but I did pretty well with just Strife. He took some punishment for sure, and the bigger enemy encounters are no less tense because for me, if Strife went down, I'm essentially completely changing up my playstyle on the fly, waiting for him to come back. This mechanic does limit the stress of failure for sure, because as long as you can maintain composure for 20 seconds or so, you're right back to two horsemen, but it's a great way to make the player mix it up between the two characters and try to get them to play to Strife and War's strengths. The combat though is just a good time. The variety is here, the hacking and slashing is still here, the badass moments are definitely still here, and all of this while adding the new twin stick mechanics and changing the perspective doesn't change the fact that it still feels like I'm participating in a Darksiders style of combat. I cannot emphasize this point enough because at a glance it looks like the perspective changes a lot and it really doesn't. It's still great fun to wail on enemies in a plethora of ways through the various upgrades from dis and dodging in and out of combat, getting out of encounters with barely a scratch, this all feels great to play and with the upgrades from Volgrim and dis requiring both souls and boatman coins that are so vital to the combat progression, it helps the player want to go out and explore these levels and locales really well. I do however have an issue not so much with the combat but sort of related and that is the power level. In Darksiders Genesis both War and Strife have their own power level that goes up through having more upgrades, more health but mostly through having more creature cores. Now creature cores drop from well creatures and have a variety of stat boosts that you apply to this creature core tree. The more you have, the more your power goes up and each mission has a power suggestion. It's not a requirement to meet that power level suggestion, but in my opinion, it all feels sort of 
irrelevant or arbitrary. Now, I want to be clear, I didn't test out just no power or anything like that in the later levels, but in the early game, I was frequently under the recommendation and it didn't seem to affect much. It's not a massive issue, but it gets highlighted so frequently that you'd think if you're under the recommended level that you'd be in for a world of hurt, and I didn't experience that just sort of felt like a number because even when I was hundreds above the recommended, I'm not absolutely invincible or wiping out enemies in an instant, you know? Again, not a huge issue because it doesn't noticeably impact the combat, making it a blast to play regardless, but just a system I found to be a bit strange. Where the combat comes to a head, or at least forces the player to use all the tools in their belt, all the lessons that they've learned thus far though, is in the game's many boss fights. Now each mission in Genesis has at least one boss fight, so give or take that's at least 16 boss encounters, and obviously, I'm not going to go into detail about every single battle. I'm mainly avoiding detailing every single boss because some early game big bosses reappear later on in a mini boss fashion, such as the Slug Demon or the Legion Bolt Spitter. All the bosses are good fun and provide intense moments that are beautifully accompanied by this game's soundtrack. I mean, damn, it goes hard. But I wanna focus on the five main boss fights because I do believe they are well, the cream of the crop, and they also don't reappear in more standard enemy fashion. Outside of these five battles though, I do just want to quickly shout out the tutorial boss in the Hollow Fiend because these sorts of battles are important for the player. You want to give the player a sense of power, but also teach them tools and ways to play the game that will expand further the longer they play, and I think the Hollow Fiend nails both of these. One, it's a big boss, so the power fantasy of slaying something like that is there by default, but it isn't a pushover fight. It's not one of the hardest fights, but he has a good amount of attacks, they're well telegraphed, and give the player enough time to learn what everything does, but at least from a more purely strife perspective, it teaches the player the importance of distance with an enemy that is stationary. The Fiend can attack basically the entire arena, but he is also always in the same spot, allowing the player to learn the dashes and ranged attacks required for general combat. That's the purpose really of a lot of the bosses I won't be going over. The more mini or lesser boss battles are all trying to teach you mechanics for either general combat or what the big bad demons and angel may use in their fights, whilst at the same time giving you a sense of power by defeating them. Anyway, tutorial and other bosses out of the way, the first real boss is against the demon Mamon, which is a good first test. Mamon is quite rangy in his attacks as well, but he can disappear and reappear quite quickly and also summons these tombstones that constantly summon enemies until destroyed, which is easier said than done. A mirror that clones himself and in general his attacks can appear almost bullet hell like. It's just the right amount of chaos for the player's first big battle in my opinion. Mamon can do quite a bit of damage to you if you aren't careful, but also most of his attacks aren't centered around him actually attacking you. If you can keep an eye out for which one is the real Mamon, dodge and weave through the projectiles, make sure he hasn't gone underground and utilize Strife's ultimate mode effectively, unlike myself, then he will go down without too much issue. It's a tense encounter, but not overly challenging. Just try not to get distracted by the fluff of the things on screen and you'll slay the first demon lord. The next big demon we encounter is Belial, who feels like a noticeable step up from Mamon. Belial, despite his size, is deceptively quick, has a good number of ranged and close combat attacks, big AoE attacks, can heal up from time to time unless you can stop him from eating enemies along with summoning enemies to avert our gaze, and has these crystals which can only be taken out with War's Crossblade, forcing the player to mix and match the horsemen. Luckily, Belial's health pool isn't insane, as you feel like you can do a fair bit of damage to him frequently, but when you pair all these elements together as well as the small arena, this is a tricky battle. Luckily, Belial's attacks don't vary too much from phase to phase, but still, he deals big damage and can force you into corners quickly that makes him a really satisfying boss to take out. 
then in the very next mission, we come up against the corrupted angel Astarte, who seems unassuming as she rides around on her horse summoning enemies. But damn, is she a tough, tough battle. First of all, she can essentially one hit kill our horsemen if you aren't careful. She summons an absurd amount of enemies that you need to be focusing on if you don't want the battle to get out of hand and when she can be attacked, she has a huge health pool. It's one of the simpler fights in terms of her attacks and ways she deals damage but damn, she had me on the edge of my seat constantly waiting for my horsemen to revive and I like that feeling in my bosses. Makes beating them even so sweeter. Then we come up against the demon Dagon who gives off major Ursula vibes. Dagon for being so late in the game is once again a bit more of a setting target, more so about taking care of the enemies, watching out for the tentacle slams, whirlpools and oh yeah, the tsunamis he summons as well that threaten to push you off of the arena. Dagon as a fight is alright, a bit more flash than substance which isn't a terrible quality, it's just not the most challenging which is strange for the second last boss and a weird way to lead into by far the toughest encounter in the game against Moloch. Moloch is a tough, tough battle. It was the only fight that flat out killed me multiple times and got a genuine fuck you when I defeated him in excitement. Moloch is quick, the arena is relatively small and that ultimate mode doesn't do much to whittle down that health bar. He does have some BS though. When he engulfs the arena in exploding crystals, say all you want, I have no idea where to go and I died mostly due to this attack. He doesn't have a lot of fluff to his attacks, he's not really trying to distract you and because of that, it's a much more mono e mono fight and it's just tough. He is lightning quick, does so much damage, puts you on the back foot with great frequency and most of his attacks are fair. Again, that arena engulfing one, at least personally, I have no clue what's going on. But overall, he's a fair but extremely tough fight and really does earn the right to be the final fight in the game. Again, there are more battles than just the main five, but as a whole, they're just all good fun. The main battles may more often than not be more tense encounters, but each one has their own strategies and tricks that make them a lot of fun to tackle and defeat. They're also mostly very gameplay oriented and not so much worried about the spectacle because that comes with the bright lights and all that on screen. I really enjoyed the bosses in Genesis. They hit that balance of power trip, spectacle and challenge really well and I cannot emphasize this enough, the soundtrack that accompanies these bosses and combat encounters is what helps these moments feel as epic or badass as they do. It's this time around in the video where I go on and say there is more to Genesis than just the combat and where that is true it's still a whole lot of combat. Now this was something I went over in my Darksiders 3 retrospective, and in a way I think was a big reason why 3 didn't feel like a true Darksiders experience. So what's different about Genesis? Why does Genesis still feel like a true to form Darksiders experience even with a heavy emphasis on combat? Here's the thing with Genesis's gameplay flow. You'll be facing off against enemies quite a bit. I mean, even in the more open levels, as soon as you mount your horse and head just down the road, you're usually coming up against some sort of foe. So yes, a good majority of the levels do center around fighting off demons or angels, but that's not to say the platforming challenges or puzzles don't exist. Those moments just also have some form of combat, either in those moments or very shortly after. The breaks from combat are much shorter than say a Darksiders or Darksiders 2, but also you have to take into consideration that the gameplay is much more broken up than before. The levels don't flow from one to another and they only last between 30 minutes to an hour and because of that the combat feels more present than maybe it otherwise would be. With all that being said though, the other elements in regards to Genesis are no less fine tuned and incorporated into the level progression. As I said, you still have a number of dungeons, you have open level design, some even with multiple paths of progression, you have side objectives and missions, collectibles to hunt down and, well, collect, platforming and puzzles, all that sort of stuff is still here and really well done to boot. 
The only lacking element in my opinion is the puzzles, as there is some, but not a bunch at least, that I can vividly recall. The puzzles I do recall felt more like platforming challenges than actual puzzles, like the time gates with multiple switches to reach a grand prize, but outside of that, and maybe a few others I'm forgetting, it feels like the weakest link in the gameplay features. Puzzles aside though, the levels themselves are so tightly designed and varied in appearance to boot. You have plenty of secrets, collectibles and extra objectives to seek out and complete. The platforming gets plenty of time to shine through those secrets with tricky platforming challenges that involve both strife and war special abilities. And in general, despite the heavy emphasis on combat, once you clear out areas, you just want to stick around, see what you can find, whether it be a secondary entrance or a trickster door, boatman coins, chest filled with souls, or maybe a mimic to say screw you. It's just a lot of well-tuned, enjoyable to be in levels that expand a playtime of a level that should be 15 or so minutes to upwards of an hour. It's the way these levels are designed though that encourages the player to go back and revisit them. You want to go back, fully explore everything these locales have to offer, and for a game that clearly wants the player to stick around after the fact is a great quality. With that being said, when I finished up with the battle against Moloch, I had explored about as much as I could in these levels and the arena wave mode doesn't entice me to stick around so I had enough when it was all said and done but that's not something I have an issue with. I know it was an issue people brought up around launch with a lack of an end game but that's just not something I personally have a problem with because I'm happy to play a game, finish it, and then move on. As a whole though, the gameplay for Darksiders Genesis is spectacular. It's so different and yet so similar to what a Darksiders experience should play like. The perspective really doesn't change anything. The hacking and slashing still feels great, the twin stick-esque shooting, the combat variety is finely tuned, the boss fights are great fun and test your abilities and concentration in all the right ways, the levels are so well designed and constantly varied, the platforming is top notch. Really my only complaint is the lack of... I'll say obvious puzzles and maybe slightly less combat to allow for more breaks with platforming and puzzles. But overall, Genesis is just a good time to play and the 10 or so hours I spent playing the game just flew by as a result. So, was Darksiders Genesis as good as I remembered? Yeah, it was, but then again, it's only been a couple of years, so that's to be expected. I think Darksiders Genesis' biggest weakness is that on the surface, it looks like a spin-off or just simply so different from the rest of the series. And even though that isn't the case, it is something that I'm sure has pushed fans away from giving this title a go. The story is another prequel, but the chemistry between War and Strife makes this story an amazing experience. The combat is smooth, the bosses are great, the levels are spectacular, and most importantly, it all feels so true to the Darksiders formula or experience, just in a different way. Genesis shows that Darksiders can take on many forms, and yet stay true to what made this series so great. It's for that reason that I must say, if you're a fan of Darksiders and skip Genesis, I strongly recommend you give the game a go. It may take a level or two to get into, but I promise it is worth it. Airship did something really special with Genesis, and despite the change visually, the game still feels as Darksiders as ever. But this is it for Darksiders for now. I am begging either Airship or Gunfire Games though, progress the story forward now. Darksiders 4 sets the title up beautifully for all the horsemen to come together, use that original concept and make something truly special. I'll be waiting, excited to see what all you talented people come up with, but for now, this is it for the Darksiders series. Alright, now to the part of this absolute beefy boy of a video that I'm sure many of you have been waiting for. We've revisited and reviewed all four Darksiders games and now it's time to rank them. 
Just a couple of things before we get started though. First of all, I know I shouldn't have to say this, but I will. This is all my opinion. You can disagree with certain placements. Maybe I rank your favorite game at the bottom and least favorite at the top. Hell, maybe you agree with my rankings and not my reasons. I'm not you. So feel free to do your own personal rankings in the comments or, you know, you can also make a video. Secondly, I don't think any of the Darksiders games are bad. I enjoyed revisiting the whole series. In fact, ranking the series was a hell of a lot tougher than I thought at the beginning of this series. Obviously though, I did enjoy some more than others, but at the end of the day, I think the whole series is great. So just because a game is last or not the top of the list, doesn't mean it is terrible, just I enjoyed playing through another game in this series more for whatever reason. Okay, with those two points out of the way, let's get started. Coming in at number 4 is Darksiders 3. This is the perfect example of what I mean when I said these rankings were really difficult to nail down because I truly did enjoy playing through Darksiders 3. I mean, it was so much better than I remembered it being when removed from those years and years of hype building up. On its own, I think Darksiders 3 is a good game. I really enjoyed the story. I think the Souls-like approach was pretty damn successful. I mean, it's not an easy genre to pull off. I just enjoyed playing the game. But one game does have to be at the bottom, and when you do compare 3 to the rest of the series, I do think it falls short in feeling like a Darksiders experience. Again, in my opinion, not a bad game. In fact, it was really, really enjoyable and a game I recommend checking out for yourself. Just not the series high point and I think the other games do Darksiders better. At number 3 we have Darksiders Genesis. Another game I had a tough time placing because there were a good few moments whilst I was revisiting Genesis where I legitimately thought this might be my favourite. I just love the characters so much in this game. I love Strife and War's chemistry. The gameplay still feels like Darksiders yet in a new way. The soundtrack, oh my god, the soundtrack is incredible. I just think Genesis does so much right to a point if you ask me to rank the series a week, a month, a year from now, it could very well be my favourite that day. So why then is it at number 3? Well honestly, it just is hard to compete against the original two games for me. It very well could still be nostalgia, but I just think the more open and flowing nature of the other games is better suited to Darksiders rather than such abrupt ends to levels. It holds the gameplay back a smidge in my opinion. Go and play Genesis though if you haven't already, it's a great time and well worth experiencing. At number 2 we have the original Darksiders. I mean, what can I say about Darksiders 1? I'll admit it has begun to show its age, it's not perfect, and obviously it's not my personal favourite in the series. But it's a lot closer than you may think. It's a game that no matter what, I'll always look back on with fond memories. The characters are some of the best in the series. The dungeons are some of the best in the series. The combat is satisfying. Just being in this world is pure nostalgia for me. It does start on shaky grounds. It's not my favourite game to restart due to the opening hours, but when it gets going, it is incredible, and it sets up this world so amazingly that made the rest of the series possible. I don't know what else to say about Darksiders 1, except that the only reason it's number 2 for me is because I don't know how you top the sequel. Yes, coming in at number 1, in my opinion, the best Darksiders game, we have Darksiders 2. I'm sure this one was a surprise to no one given how much nostalgia I have for the game going in and then subsequently how well that nostalgia held up today. Darksiders 2 is just a flat out amazing video game. They expanded upon the foundations the original game set, evolving the combat, the world, the platforming and progression, adding new loot and RPG mechanics, and just made a game that simply is a pure joy to play. I've already gushed about this game for a good 40 minutes. You know why this is my favourite at this point, and despite my growing uninterest in the open world genre today and characters I personally don't think are as good as the original, but the combat just has such a great flow, the world is so captivating and fun to 
explore and the story is compelling. This is my ideal Darksiders experience and because of that, as of making this video, it is my favourite game in the Darksiders series. And with all that, we're finally done with the Darksiders series. Once again, let me know your own personal rankings down in the comments below because there is no right or wrong answer here. It's just personal preference. If you stuck it through to the end or watched each video as they released, well done, I'm proud of you. If you cheated and skipped ahead to the rankings, I still love you. I hope you all enjoyed this massive video though. I had a blast revisiting the Darksiders series, but I think this video is long enough, so... As always, thank you to all my lovely channel members, Infamous Sir Hellfire, FT Gaggiano, Christian Vilgag, and Cloud Connection. I truly do appreciate the extra level of support. Go subscribe, follow my socials, join the Discord, all that good stuff, and I'll see you all in the next video.